Yeah, you know, just a little bit. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Tammy, we will go ahead and get our uh, school board meeting started. It is four o'clock, and we are going to invite Casey Smith up to lead our flight salute. <laughs> of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Okay, so we will do our roll call. Uh, Tammy, we have all board members present. Scott is via Zoom. And um, we'd like to announce Dr. Yucca is sick this evening, so he's not physically in attendance here with us today. We will move on to the appointment of our new superintendent. She's here. She, well, um, <laughs> Be I can go get her. She be yeah. Yeah. No. Oh, oh, I would like to. She's got a later part. So um, we would like to do the appointment of the superintendent. And I'll, I'll motion to um, appoint her as our new superintendent. One second. So all those in favor of appointing Dr. Skinner as our new superintendent, say aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? Uh, now we'll move on to the review of the super, superintendent's contract, which you'll find a copy here in your board packet. Motion to approve. Yes, if everyone read it, it's pretty straightforward from what Scott and I were taking to the table. But is mean, there any, yeah, anything <clears throat> for you guys? But Scott and I followed what we had talked originally about. So I'd like to make a motion to approve the contract. All set. Okay. Oh, okay. Any discussion? All those in favor of approving the Dr. Skinner's employment contract, say aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? Scott, can you try talking again? Sure. Okay. You you weren't. We didn't hear your last vote, so we. Oh, so. I voted. I voted yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we'll move on to the um, one point five agenda additions, deletions, revisions, or or on to approval. <laughs> Scott, do you have any changes or deletions? No. Okay. <laughs> um, I move that we approve the agendas, the additions, deletions, and revisions from 1.5. Second. Thank you. 
All those in favor of um, accepting the agenda as written, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, we will invite Mr. Bates, uh, Jim Bates, up for um, a full presentation for further. Uh, first, welcome everybody. It's uh, nice to see such a great turnout and see our family faces. And so, thank you for making the effort. Uh, for those of you that may not know, uh, both uh, Mrs. Bates and I uh, share the job, and it's uh, it's a unique opportunity uh, for both of us and that uh, we love it so much that uh, early on we said that we'd be happy to do that again next year when we talked to uh, uh, Mr. Weeks and HR and we love the kids. Families are just fantastic to work with. Uh, it's been a joy being able to work together as a couple. It has so many unique leverages to it uh, and uh, I don't know if Stacy will completely agree with having to work with me. Uh, but you know, we talk about the school constantly, and whether it's the weekends or evenings, and so it's pretty fun to be able to get to teach with her because it took about a month and a half to reteach me on how to teach again. So and she did that by getting me started and then heading to Texas for the week and saying, You'll be fine. <laughs> so I, I think I'm. I'm fine at this point. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> she's, a, she's a great teacher and fun to be able to work with her. Those of you that know Stacy have done that already. So, but we want to just give you a small little snapshot of uh, the, something the kids were working on. We've got a few songs. They'll, they've sung one of them uh, previously. They've seen the part of their studies. Right now, we're getting ready to launch into uh, the Big Oregon Trail study. We just finished with that video. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Long term, mainly about the idea of We just finished that. Mm -hmm. Definitely pretty peppy. Uh, but just uh, see a little snapshot of what we've been working on. They'll be seeing a couple of those at our year end celebration, too, which will be coming up too fast uh, in June. So, with that, we'll bring the kids up and treat you to one of the wonderful songs. Okay. And fair warning on that dinner ride song, we'll sing along with Hobo Jim. He's got a pretty funny face. So jump in and feel it. We'll be in Alaska, the state that stands alone. There's a dog we run from that which is the norm. And it's girl and mates with a life and pace of zero dreams to the whale. And even though the night comes, no one yet is this dog that I dare not trail. Well, Jim has a team and a good breed dog, and sled that's built so fine. And let me race those miles to know 1049. Then when I get back to my home, hey, I can tell the tale. I did not see my feet, I did not trail. Well, the race won't be easy for the masters of the trail. And some of them make it, and some of them will fail. But it's just to run that race, takes a lot for a lot of free. And a lot of we've done, but the dogs are running across the old whistling tree. We'll get to the team, and I get the dog, and sled is built so fine. And let me race those miles to know 1049. Then when I get back to my home, hey, I can tell my tale. I did, I did, I did, get to the run for you. Mm -hmm. 
This is a drone song, which means there's only one chord. And so the whole school comes up.
Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. That's great. You're 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 great. I motion to approve the consent agenda. Any discussion? All those in favor of approval of the consent agenda, say aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? No. Terry, we'll move on to you with our curriculum adoption committee updates. Our point, sorry. Hi, everybody. I am just here in your packet. You have the names of three different or names of people on three different committees for curriculum um, review. And then you also have board policy IIA-AR, which kind of describes in case you needed a refresher around what the board appointed review committee does or the process around uh, adopting curriculum. So I am asking today um, for you to approve all the names that have volunteered for each one of the committees, both uh, science, math, and English language proficiency. <laughs> I moved. Oh, yeah. Are are you able to navigate with all of them for each of these nights you've already set? Yep. Or they're aware of. Yep. Okay. Yep. Sorry. Yeah, I moved I to approve the um, committee selections, and it looks like you have a lot of people. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. Are we doing yeah. Um, do we want to? Uh, yeah. So, all motion to approve or uh, yeah. adopt the science. Yeah, you want to read that name. So, um, so if you want to do this one, so for the science for Barbara Liu, Eric Osborne, Debbie Wood, Calista Stong's dad, Michael Custard, Holly Haynes, and Jennifer Alpernap. All those in favor of approving Barbara Bue, Eric Osborne, Debbie Wood, Calista Songstan, Michael Custer, Holly Haynes, and Jennifer Abernathy for our Science Curriculum Adoption Committee say aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? <laughs> I'll do math. Um, I move to appoint. Uh, for math, K through eight, Karina Cole, mm -hmm. Debbie Wood, Calista Songstan, Jordan Rusher. Rusher, thank you, Shelly Courier, and Jim, Jennifer Abernathy. The math curriculum, K through eight, adoption committee. A second. All those in favor of approving Karina Call, Debbie Wood, was the song stand, Jordan Rasher, Shelly Courier, and Jennifer Abernathy for our math K through eight curriculum adoption committee. Say aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? The 13 ones. <laughs> <laughs> Before you go on to the next one, Jessica, my computer just froze up. Can you give me just two seconds yeah. so I can? Thank you. Uh, not letting me well, we have a really long see. list. So really long if list. you don't mind, we'll keep going and we'll wait for you after this. That works. Because you have a list of the names. Is that right? Or do you yes. Want I'm going to help you. Yes, thank you. Move to approve. Uh, the, uh, move to approve Riley Campbell, Karina Call, Maria Camposano, Camposano, Teresa Ortiz, Valdemar. I couldn't tell if that was an R on him. Yeah. Valdemar Ortiz, Guadalupe <laughs> Cruz, Elvia, Elvia Sanchez, Silva Robert, Robles, Robles, Robert, Roberto, Calvillo, Calvillo, Lorena. Via Lobos, Via Lobos, Daisy Reynoso, Reynoso 
Adrena, Tapia, and yours is it, Villasana. How'd you pronounce it? Villasana. Yes. To the English language from physics and curriculum committee. I said that. Okay. I'll help. Um, are you okay, Sam? Um, it's still working on it. So um, yes. Oh wait, you're good, Tammy. That's okay. Okay. It's just really slow. I'll make one of the copies. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So, um, all those in favor of appointing Riley Campbell, Karina Call, Maria Campuzano, Teresa Ortiz, Valdemar Ortiz, Guadalupe Cruz, Elva Sanchez, Sylvia Robles, Robles, Roberto Calvillo, Calvillo, uh, Lorena. Via Lobos. <laughs> Via Lobos. Daisy Reynoso. Yep. Adriana. Um, Adriana Tapia. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, how do you? Yours at? Yours at? Via Sana. Via Sana. Say aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? Thank you, guys. Yeah. Okay, Joel, we will move on to you for our strategic plan report. Yeah, Carrie was supposed to take 20 minutes. So, guys, we have some bonus time to talk about <laughs> our goals. So, just to put everything in context, if you remember, we set these goals, I want to say January, February. Um, we usually report on these quarterly. So, this is, we just finished up trimester two at the end of March. So, all this data um, is based off trimester two. So, I'll just go ahead and get started. This is our first quarterly boards report. So feel free to stop me if you have questions, you want to go deeper in something. Um, what you'll find in your packet, of course, I've got a chart for you. Um, so this, I, these are actually my notes and I figured it, it would actually really help kind of guide things along. So feel free to follow along. Um, you got a chart in your packet. Uh, so with that, uh, the board set goals in January around three key areas, instruction, community, and facilities, uh, safety, and operations. Do you want to give a big gold star to Mr. Jim Bates? He's got his Kirk County School District strategic plan hanging up right when you uh, walk in. So Mr. Bates, well, well done. <laughs> or sorry, Mrs. Bates, uh, probably more Bates likely. Um, so what you'll see, we set these goals and uh, traditionally how we've reported these to the board quarterly is through a stoplight system. Um, green being once a year. Let's go here. Okay. Yeah. We just wanted to make sure we could see you, Mr. Cooper. Uh, so uh, I'll give a report on each of our indicators. So we have three key goals. Uh, under each goal is about five to eight uh, objectives that we've set. Just to go over big picture. So green light, this is not uh, overly scientific. Green light means we either uh, the objective is complete or there's a plan in place and we're making good progress. Uh, if it's a yellow, we have a plan, but we need to make more progress. We're not quite where we need to be, or we need to make adjustments to that plan for improvement. And then finally, a red means we've got lots of work that needs to be done in this area. 
Um, I always give this disclaimer. We get, we don't get paid any more or any less based on, on how we rate these. This is just an objective assessment, um, how, how we feel, how we're doing. So with that, um, I'm actually going to start. Uh, I thought we we're going to be a little tight on time. So I'm going to start with goal three, because I think we'll be able to go through goal three and two quicker, and then we can spend a lot of the meat of our conversation talking around our instructional goal. So it's, uh, it had goal three in your packet. We've got our eight objectives. Um, objective number one, I'll start with the ones that we marked green. So uh, objective 3.1, complete a successful superintendent search and hiring process. This one could have been really awkward if Dr. Skinner didn't show up just now. Um, so uh, we're gonna give that a green light. Uh, that has been uh, completed. Uh, we're excited. Uh, goal 3.3, maintain a strong and stable financial position. You'll see in your uh, chart, there's a links there. Um, that will take you to the monthly reports that Anna does on the budget. And you can hold on to this electronic document. It's been emailed to you. So that way, if you want to go back and look, um, we'll get the finance report to you every uh, every uh, month. Uh, and then upcoming, uh, the next steps around this one is uh, the 24-25 budget committee begins April 25th and April 30th. So that'll be the next steps around keeping that strong and stable financial position. Uh, our next green light on that is uh, enhanced safety and security measures in all school buildings. I'm not gonna pull up that link, but uh, if you click that link that's in your board packet uh, when you're at your computer, that'll take you to the list. There's about 15 things, uh, safety improvements that Leland and his team have uh, already completed this school year. Um, at the end of each year, Leland looks through other security and safety measures and comes up with the plan for next year. So that'll be kind of the next step on that. And then finally, uh, this is actually a completely new initiative that the board asked for in January. Uh, increase the ongoing training for Kirk County School District, District athletic coaches through quarterly coaches summits. Uh, Mr. Cooper, you'll see I got the apostrophe right on uh, this one now, so uh, no need to uh, fix that. So this has actually been a really exciting project. Uh, I worked with Mr. Bonner and Mr. Huffman on this. The board asked that we provide more training, just, just like we do for our teachers, where it's not just one training at the start of the year, but ongoing training for our coaches. Um, Mr. Bonner and Mr. Huffman have put together a plan. You'll see the, the dates, uh, May 7th, uh, 2024. So, so this spring, Rob will host the first uh, Coaches Summit. Uh, they'll talk about the vision for Coaches Summits and improvement. Um, we've set four dates, so quarterly next year, August 13th. They'll work with our coaches. The topics right now are communication and fundraising. Um, in October, looks like we'll talk about relationships and equipment. And then next February, they'll talk about utilizing assistant coaches. So they're identifying key topics that our coaches will uh, be working with and, and providing ongoing professional development of that. So that's something the board asked for that uh, Anna was able to, to, to um, we got some grant funds. I think we're able to allocate some money to, to pay coaches to be there. So that way they're getting current coaching uh, throughout the year. So Joel, are they having their first meeting May 7th? May 7th, okay. yeah. We, uh, we kind of jumped all over this one. So uh, any questions on those four that we just went over? All right, let's shift to our yellow lights. So these are ones where we're making progress, but not quite where we need to be. Um, assess district facilities through long range planning and explore uh, potential bond options. This is one where uh, I linked in your packet, the uh, bond informational packet from the January 29th special, special session where we went through what's, what's in the bond. Um, our next steps around this one would be the actual bond election. So that'll be in May coming up. So um, we're making some progress there. Need a need to kind of take this thing to the finish line. Um, next up will be uh, 3.6, ensure all students have access to a school counselor. We actually, this one, I'm gonna say we could shift and be like a yellowish greenish because uh, shout out to Mr. Hayes, who's here, uh, mm -hmm. him, uh, myself and Mr. Weeks met with OSU Cascades about their counseling program to try to get a direct pipeline. So we have a potential candidate there. Um, I believe we just approved a new hiring of a counselor for next year from Montana. So Marcus said, I'm some great recruiting. So we look like we will have uh, two fully staffed counselors at the middle school uh, at this point. So that's a big improvement. Um, that was something I know the board was really, uh, really adamant about, especially with all the mental health concerns we're seeing. Um, so that's something we're excited about. Uh, we believe we'll have two and, and uh, that way that counselor we shifted over from the high school will be able to go back to the high school. Um, so any questions there? Do we still have that 
other applicant that Jay was talking about? I thought we had two out of state applicants. I think I, I think there's still two. Like we have one for sure, and then we have two that we're still working on that that look likely. So that okay. And I'll tell you we what. We more applicants yeah, that we're going. Through. Yeah. Okay. And I believe that position uh, was posted for two years without any qualified applicants. So it's it's big. We we really worked to. Uh, Kind of pound the pavement and shake the trees, and and yeah. we're able to find some counselors. So, so and that's then exciting. this program you guys are doing with OSU Cascade. So, will that kind of give teachers like that are or counselors that are finishing their program like an internship type? Yeah. What, or do what they need to work under a um, licensed counselor? So yeah. So they traditionally go through an internship period where they're working under a licensed counselor. So okay. because we have a full time licensed counselor there for next year. That means we would be able to, if okay. needed, bring in an intern. Okay. But we believe we also might be able to just hire a, a fully licensed counselor, not just an intern. So, so out of OSU counselor. We it's believe like a, so. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, so I, I think uh, Marcus is meeting with a candidate uh, on Friday. I want to say from OSU Cascade. So and Jay and I and Marcus met with their program coordinator to hopefully like build that relationship to where we kind of start to get more applicants as as needed. So. Great. Um, our next steps, finalizing the recruitment. And then, um, you know, one of the things as we dug into this was uh, our counselors, just like kids we support, they, they need to have colleagues and support too. And that's why we wanted to have, make sure we had two counselors there so they're not okay. overwhelmed um, caseloads and stuff. So, so we're kind of refining some systems there as well. Um, and then finally, uh, 3.7, uh, connect all students to at least one extracurricular team, club, or opportunity. Like Mr. Cooper says, this might be one of our, our biggest safety uh, benefits is if we can get kids connected, they've got friends, um, they've got an activity like they do, they've got a reason to show up to school. Um, we believe that really helps with our school safety and is great for kids overall with their attendance, engagement. Um, so I've got some numbers there uh, for the middle school. In the fall, they had 214 um, spots filled in their clubs and sports. In the winter, they had 217 students participating. Um, the total number of unique kids uh, was 330. So that's over half our kids at the middle school are connected to some club or sport, which is which is awesome. Um, at the high school, I need to get that phone number, but I know in the winter they had 355 students um, signed up for a club or a sport. And in the spring, uh, Mr. Upton was able to give me those numbers. They have 299 students signed up. So um, 600 students, which makes up about two thirds of the high school. So. Uh, really encouraging, but I think this is one thing that we have to keep the gas on and making sure that um, Anna and I try to get creative and find as many grants as we can to expand our clubs. Um, one of my dreams is to get an after school bus option because right now, if the students rely on just bus transportation, they might not be able to stay later if, if a parent can't pick them up. So, we're wanting to make sure that we can maybe explore those transportation options so a kid could just catch an after school uh, or an after clubs bus. So that's that's kind of a good next step. Uh, we also wanna reestablish our partnership with uh, Crook County Parks and Rec, uh, particularly at the elementary level, a lot of our sports run through Parks and Rec. So we wanna make sure that we have a strong relationship with them. Um, and then returning to a consistent participation tracking process. So that'll make pulling these numbers a, a lot less, uh, a lot lighter lift on our administrators. So Joel, your total numbers are those throughout the year that aren't sports related. So when you no, say that that includes clubs and athletics. Okay. All right, and we got a red, guys. Um, okay. So our our red is uh, three point four. Uh, establish and maintain effective, clearly written policies to help guide district operations. And the reason this is red, and we're actually uh, super fortunate. Uh, Anna discovered. I want to say through uh, looking into a policy that uh, OSBA, who we contract with to upload and maintain our policies when you go to the website, had somehow uh, uploaded an old policy or another district's policy for ours. Um, so we are completing, a, we're doing an audit to look through everything that they've uploaded to make sure they are correct with what's been approved um, by our board. So uh, Tanya Howard's doing an awesome job going through policy and policy. Tammy's helping out as well, going through to make sure that um, they have uploaded the correct policies for us. Um, so that's a big deal. So we're um, our next steps, uh, we're going to do a board review and update policies in April and October work session. So in talking with um, Chair Brumble, we are wanting to uh, not bring like 10 policies every meeting, but rather have work sessions where then um, you guys can focus on the on like a group of policies. So we'll start that in April. 
Um, we're told the April OSBA uh, policy update has 50, uh, 50 new policies to review. So um, we're gonna have to figure out that's unmanaged, <laughs> unrealistic um, for the board to under, you know, fully grasp 50 policies. So we're gonna look through what we can do to make sure that's something that makes sense for you guys and, and make sure you can really get good eyes on all the policies. And that's in April? No, they, so, oh, go ahead. Oh, no. Sorry. Um, we have an April 29th work session. Right. Um, OSBA generally releases batches of policies in both October and April. Okay. So that's why we set a work session um, we just, for those. We didn't know it would be this large. So now we have to get a different game plan for how we now get 50 reviews done. Okay. So it might be another, an extra work session where it's just policies, but Joel and I want to look at trying to maybe group them like like policies on night. So yeah, so it's not jumping all over, but it's a bit easier to review kind of this category and this category. Um, so we didn't realize it would be a yeah. yeah Tammy emailed like, me when she got it. She was like, "It's fifty. Yeah. I'm like, "Okay." It's so usually like eight to fifteen yeah. was high, and then they they just came with no. them. We just found out. I want to say earlier this. Uh, last week. So, yeah. um, and then a next step on this one that we've just began preliminary conversations is maybe a shift away from OSBA hosting our policies on our website. Um, if we're running into issues and we're paying them to host it and we're finding errors, that's something we want to explore and whether that's uh, the best partnership for us uh, for this particular task. So talking with Eric about different options we have to maybe host our own policies or, or explore what, what else is out there. What is the I guess the procedure in that are they you just submit them blank so, to, to a web to an email address or yeah, so typically do you want to explain Tammy? Yeah, so once you approve the policy, I take that approved policy okay. and email it to my contact at OSBA, and then they're supposed to replace the one and update the website with the okay. corrected one, making the changes okay. that we've included. Okay. So um, right now, what I'm doing is going back, and once that new policy gets uploaded, I'm going through and making sure that they've captured all their changes. Okay. Okay. What we've seen in the past is maybe they capture one or two, but then they don't get all of the changes. So okay. sometimes it's, it's taking a little bit of back and forth to make sure that all the approved changes are being captured okay. until we have the correct okay. yeah, so we're, we're looking at a way that we could do that maybe more in-house. Or... Yeah, we could just host our own page um, right. through our technology department and it'd be on our website. So that way we know it's all internal and we're not getting um, errors with, is, is kind of the plan. Okay. Um, the, the one kind of hesitation is there's a really good search function where you're looking at like the keyword and you can pull up all the policies that we have on drones, for example. So we want to make sure we have those capabilities so that our community can look up uh, phrases and policies. Uh, so we're just kind of Doing yeah. that, making sure we we can provide a good service before we pull the plug on on uh, OSB hosting. Okay. Yeah, okay. just an idea. So, mm -hmm. okay. uh, any questions around goal three? Uh, do we know at the elementary club level? I know, like Taylor gave. Um, yeah. In her presentation, they had. It seemed like hundreds of clubs. So that's maybe a little bit of an exaggeration, but they had a club. It seemed like for. Yeah, I mean, almost that, anything you could think of. So I'm just curious on that front. Yeah. So how would that work? As, as long school? as our internet works uh, decently out here. Yeah, there's no student names. Um, uh, so I linked on your chart. So if you open this on your computer, it links to the club menus. That's what they have? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we were able to get a grant and we use something called the Student Investment Account Funds where we give each school about eight to 10 club spots. Uh, and what that means is the principal then goes to their staff and says, hey, which which staff members out there want to start a club? And staff say, you know, whether it's, I know there's like Dungeons and Dragons at the high school, elementary, uh, yes. chess. Uh, if we had good internet, it'd be pretty fancy. I could show you their menu right there, <laughs> but uh, I think our internet's a little slow right now. That's okay. Um, so okay. typically um, our elementaries have about 10 club options, three or four per trimester. Okay. Um, and then a lot of, uh, one of the things I talked about was making sure we're connected with Parks and Rec, because that's what a lot of our kids get connected with, whether it's soccer or you know, basketball. And we just want to make sure that um, that relationship that we have with Parks and Rec is really strong so that we know that we can kind of hand kids off to them and we know they're connected some way. Because 
just like you've seen with like in Crook County, like Mac Club or, um, you know, soccer. The more that we can have programs starting at the elementary level and going up, the more competitive our high school teams are going to be. So any other questions? All right. Let's jump now to, uh, we'll go to goal number two, which is um, all around the community. So we've got five objectives here. Uh, our greens are 2.1, uh, conduct quarterly board superintendent community listening sessions. Um, I think so. I've been to, we, we scheduled four. Uh, I think we've done three. I want to say Steve and Jen and I were at the, the February one, so the second one. And I think we had a strong turnout of four people. Uh, yeah. Two of which were Boy Scouts, which was awesome. Yes. Uh, and then uh, Cheyenne and Scott, I want to say we're at the March, the most recent one. We had a, probably about 20 to 30 people, I would say. So that one was really well attended. Um, we also, the next one will be May 20th. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's Cheyenne and That's Jessica, I want to say. So, um, and then a question the board will want to look at as we plan next year is, is are these something we want to continue um, the community listening sessions quarterly? So. Uh, that'll be something that we can talk about our July work session as we review these goals. Uh, our next objective, three point, or sorry, 2.3, uh, improve family and community access to school curriculum and library resources. Um, so some, Carrie uh, Lombach's been busy making sure we have a curriculum library. That's new where any community member, any parent can come into the district office and she has all the curriculums syllabi for all our courses. Mm -hmm. Um, if any community member is ever interested, just get a hold of uh, Carrie Lombach and she'll invite you. If our internet worked, I do have a picture of it, is the link on, on that. So um, just, it is a real thing. I don't think anyone's ever taken us up on it. But uh, if anyone's interested, oh, we've had one person take us up on it. But uh, it's there and, and all are welcome to come check if they just want to see what curriculums we have. I use uh, it regularly, Joel. <laughs> Carrie uses it time. <laughs> I mean. But you kind of get paid to use it. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, we also I have a link there to our library uh, database access. Uh, Mr. Ryan's done an awesome job troubleshooting that so it's user friendly for parents. So if folks want to know what's in our libraries. Uh, it's all accessible online. You don't have to be a parent. You can be a community member uh, and you can access that through our website. Uh, and then finally, uh, three point, sorry, 2.4, uh, provide weekly school and district communication to CCSD families. Uh, the link there. Uh, Mr. Carr has an awesome uh, web page that I didn't know about until I asked him that has um, the most recent three weekly newsletters, monthly newsletters, and staff newsletters. Um, so that way, if you miss something or you're interested in what's going on, um, you can click that link and it'll take you to it. And anyone uh, publicly can access that as well. Where do they find that link? Um, it is under, I want to say, if you go to the district website, under communications department, or it's under staff, I want to say. There's some. Yeah, we double check it. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll get that. I, I know if you click that link, it takes it to you. So I know it's on the, the district website. I'm not just sure what uh, subheading. Okay. Uh, next, our one yellow light is 2.2, uh, which is increase the number of volunteers and awareness of volunteers opportunities in school. Um, one thing that we've done uh, is, is in talking with the board and talking with staff, COVID. Uh, was a horrible travesty for our schools in the sense that it it blocked parents out, it blocked community members out, where they had to go through all these hoops to become a volunteer. Um, that's been uh, done a huge disservice to kids where we're now wanting to, there's no more requirements for anything. We want to get uh, community and family back in schools helping students. Um, so we've created a new volunteer interest form that will roll out later this spring. Um, and we're working with principals to identify uh, additional opportunities for volunteers. So uh, one of the, our next steps, we're going to update our volunteer website. Uh, we created this new form that I would show you if our, our internet was, was a little quicker. Um, we're also working on, uh, we have pretty strict procedures so that no adult in our building uh, is unsupervised with kids, as well as we want to make sure those procedures are tight. And then we want to help have volunteers, maybe whether they're helping students with reading or studying, uh, making it really clear that anyone can come into uh, anyone that's you know passed the background check, um, they know what to do when they come into school, so they can effectively um, help teach kids whether it's um, reading to them or whether it's teaching them phonics or flashcards. 
So we're working with principals to figure out what do those procedures look like so that they can be effective volunteers in our schools. So those are things that we'll be developing over the next couple months and report out at the next um, the next meeting. Uh, one thing that I want to say, Cheyenne, we've, uh, I think you've been contacted by various community members, or sorry, community organizations interested in um, uh, the board members speaking at their groups to recruit volunteers, um, which would be awesome, like, you know, whether it's the Kiwanis or uh, the Eagles. Is Eagles? Um, we have the Republican Party, the Democratic Party yeah. want us to come speak and get on their agenda yeah. um, to bring, like, volunteer lists and what they can do to help with reading and uh, present some options for them to help volunteer, like, in the schools and help out. But... Um, uh, they're interested in um, bond issues, like what yeah. they would like to see on the bond. Um, but in order to go out, like if we went out two at a time, we'd have to have approval from the board to okay us to go to these organizations yeah. and, if you're and speak go out on speak behalf on that, of the yeah. board. To, so maybe at the end of this presentation, we'll ask for a motion to give approval and we can figure out the logistics. Right? The Democrats and Republics are Republican. They're both asking for this for get involved. I think we want to take advantage of that. So yeah. that would be that would be awesome. Joel, do you know where we're at on the smart reading programs in all of our elementary schools? Yeah, I know it's in Crooked River, and I think this initiative is is meant to fill those gaps at the other elementary. So my my goal would be that we have volunteers in schools reading with kids at all our schools next year from you know hopefully day one. And I, I think I don't want to overstep um, no, my speaking, yeah. but within the smart reading program in particular, they're having a really hard time um, with that program out of been like um, with volunteers and some funding issues and whatnot. So we felt uh, or Joel thought it was a good idea as well if we can make sure that all the schools are getting supplemented until maybe some of their kinks get worked out to make sure we have volunteers in reading, maybe doing some in-house programs. Yep. And, so that none of the um, none of the schools are left without a program for helping with reading. Am I? Yeah. Is that correct? And here's a bonus. This is something I'm working on that I think would be really cool. I read a lot of research on um, getting fathers and father figures involved in the schools it makes a huge difference. Um, so that'll be another push that I think we'll try to develop next year is an intentional push to get fathers and father figures in schools to, to work with kids as well because I think that can really improve their their academics as well. Any questions? Uh, this last one, it's yellow, but I gave it a little bit of red. Uh, so it's more of an orange. Uh, so increase family participation at conferences. So spring conferences are coming up uh, April 18th and 19th. Um, we'll have, uh, we'll get back to tracking uh, how many students have a guardian represented at, at conferences. So that's something we'll start this year, or sorry, start this spring. Uh, we also should see schools are sending out their individual communications around, you know, how to sign up for conferences and whatnot. But I think this is one kind of getting back to our volunteers that I really want to keep the board to keep on their radar, where we have to continue to, to push parents um, of, for, for all students to get involved in their child's education. I think that is one of our huge ticket items that we have to keep the, the, uh, the focus on um, to getting our parents involved. So that'll, that'll be one that we kind of, I, I hope, can carry over to next year. Any questions around goal two? Yeah, it looks like we have back to school nights. Back to school nights, yes. So um, that was under 2.3. So uh, tentatively planned, we uh, talked with our administrators. Chair Brumble, I know this was one that you wanted to make sure we got out there. So um, our elementary back to school nights uh, are looking tentatively to be on um, that Thursday, August 29th, uh, 2024. And then our middle school, high school uh, will be that first day of freshmen and sixth graders, which would be, I think, Tuesday, September 3rd. Um, so those are the kind of current plans and uh, families will learn about those through uh, newsletters, back to school packets, social media. So we'll make sure to get the word out. And we put them on separate nights this year. So uh, families that have multiple kids. So that was a, that was a request. So Joel, on the smart reading programs with supplementing, is there a way that um, like the high school kids that do like TA and stuff like that might be able to be I'm glad like in a program up. like this? Where yeah, they... so I'll actually talk about that uh, under goal one. Where, oh, okay. um, yeah, we're looking to partner with um, 
having high school, actually Chelsea Kurtz, um, at one of our English high school teachers is um, working with, I wanna say Steens Pillar right now to figure out scheduling logistics to potentially send high schoolers down to work with um, elementary students on their phonics and whatnot, uh, kind of like that star, star reading model, so. Okay. It's good when you ask questions because it gives me a chance not to talk. So <laughs> I, uh, questions are, are more than welcome. Yeah. All right, let's jump to our last area, uh, instruction. So this is where a lot of the meat of our board goals are. Uh, let's start with our greens. Um, increase the number, uh, 1.3, increase the number of instructional assistants providing academic support. I had Jay pull those numbers. So uh, last school year, we had 53 IA positions. Um, this school year, we have 69. So if my math's right, 16% uh, uh, increase from last year on that one. So I know that was a big uh, board goal. Uh, one thing I want to highlight, though, because I, I don't think just having the numbers is enough. And Jen, I think this is something you brought up where let's make sure not only we have aides, but they're trained well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a warm body that they know exactly what to do, that we're giving them the proper training and skills so that when they're working with a kid, that they are improving their reading, they are improving their literacy and their math. So that's something that I think we'll work on, um, hopefully bringing in some ideas from Texas uh, for next year on how we can best get those, mm -hmm. those folks trained up. So Perfect. thank you. No problem. And then were these, were the new hires spread across the district or did we find that we put them mainly like, you know, an elementary, did we spread an elementary, middle, high? What did we do with the extra? The new ones were mainly elementary. Um, working with the board, I, I want to say mainly at, uh, the lower grades, K1. K uh, K yeah, K1, 2, 3. So uh, primarily the elementary, and we are trying. Um, another one of the board goals we'll talk about here in a second is horizontal alignment of staff. Right. So we are really looking at all our schools to make sure that it's equitable, um, that Proportionally, there's the right number based on how many students the school the school has or the, the kids' needs. Uh, let's go to 1.6, uh, implement a high-quality AP program and increase uh, the number of students passing the AP exams. Um, this is one I'll, I'll make sure to email the board to because I really want to show this, uh, and, I, and I can if the internet's not working. Um, our, I want to say, let's put it on here. Um, I want to say we're at 63% of our AP tests were three or above, which is the highest we've had in five years. And that was, uh, and the amount of tests was about normal. So we are trending in a good direction. Um, that's mainly based on the hard work, I think of our high school teachers, as well as we started that AP committee. Um, I think they actually even met last week. There's a link, uh, that link will take you to their notes, their ongoing notes, uh, any quarterly. Um, the next steps on this one, I, I, I would propose that we keep that AP committee going next year just to keep the focus on improving um, our AP program and making sure students are passing those assessments. Um, next up, 3.7, um, provide a robust career and technical edge ed, education. Always get to the uh, midway through this one. I talk a lot at the board goal. So uh, career and technical education courses and industry certification. So Ryan Cochran provides a, uh, every other month, he provides an update uh, that is linked to on here. So you can go back and look at all the different CTE programs and what they're doing. Um, they're also that shock grant, uh, students helping our community. That was the, I wanna say 200 or $400,000 that Facebook gave uh, to help them fix up various community uh, nonprofits in the, in the um, community. So that one I believe is a interview from Central Oregon Daily that's here today uh, where they fixed up the Humane Society and what they've done. So really, really cool project. Um, definitely go check that out. And they also just finished their eighth grade transition day last week where they invite all the eighth graders mm -hmm. in the high school and they get a mini lesson at, at I think all nine of our CTE strands. So the middle schoolers get to, you know, kind of build some excitement around what they're gonna be able to do with the high school. and. Um, that, then they sign up for their electives. So really cool. Um, definitely a green light going on there. Uh, and then 1.8, increase the number of students earning college credit through dual credit courses. Um, Mr. Huffman and his team at the high school, they've implemented a new dual credit tracking system. Um, Mr. Cooper and I have worked on this over the last couple of years uh, where you have a, a senior graduate and then you have to dig around and hope they remember all the different college courses they've taken while in high school. And it just was a mess. So I think after uh, Mr. Cooper pushing for two or three years, 
we finally have created a system where internally we are tracking that. So then when a kid goes to um, graduate, that we can print off, here are all your courses from the seven different colleges that we articulate with. So um, that's in place that year and or this year. And uh, Ms. Van Roke and Mr. Oppen have done a great job getting that going. And that should really help parents and save parents a lot of money. So Joy, I have a question on the CT. Is there a way that we could um, kind of see the pathways? It's great that we have robust programs, but can we see the pathways of, you know, when they start here, when they finish, what are they leaving our schools with? What, you know, it's not like, it's great to take one or two classes, but do we have any that like from start to finish, you're leaving with a certification that says, hey, you can go be this yeah. or you can go do this. Yeah, the Oregon so, Dar Department of Ed actually makes us track whether they take a, a sequence, so we'll, we'll, we can get that data very easily. Do we know what our sequence is, if they take them all, what they can do with that? Yeah, that so um, at the July board meeting, we actually present uh, for the whole year how many industry certifications that, that students earned. So, which is really important because that was one of our big goals is that students leave high school with, let's say it's welding, for example, that right. they passed a welding certification that they then can walk into an employer and say, uh, I, I can already start it at this point. So that really helps students. So um, that's something that we'll report to in July. Okay. Any other questions on, on our greens? Let's uh, jump into our yellows. So um, let's go to 1.1, all students proficient in reading, writing, math. And then the board actually asked in February that we add social studies and science on here. Um, I'm going to start with uh, grades 9 through 12. And uh, I guess they can't see that on there. Um, so what, what you're looking at where it says ELA, math, science, social studies, those are the percentage of students. So we looked at all trimester two grades and we said, what percentage of students were proficient? So uh, I, I set it at a C or better. So that means you, you passed your, your science class with a C or better. So those are the percentages there. And then on the writing, uh, that 91.2, that's how many high schoolers passed uh, their winter writing uh, work sample. So 91% of students pass their work samples, and those are graded by their English teachers um, using, using a rubric. Is that all grades? Yep, that'd be grades 9 through 12. Um, another thing we did uh, that's kind of become a practice is, I want to say even last week. Uh, so last week, Mr. Huffman, uh, Ms. Jonas, Ms. Kudlak, and I go through every student that is off track on credits and come up with an individual plan. So um, we're doing that as well. So this shows you know, how kids are doing grade-wise, as well as uh, making sure every kid that's not progressing or getting behind on credits has a, a plan to get caught up. Let's go to the middle school. Um, same measure. Uh, that's the number of students, or sorry, the percentage of students that were past that particular course with a C or better. So, for example, English language arts, 78.7 students passed with a C or better. Uh, the writing is 58.3. That's very, and I kind of look back at how we've done in the past, and what you'll look, if you look from K to 12, Kirk County School District writing, you'll see uh, at kindergarten, it's very low, like 10%. And each year, it, it great, creates this great upward trajectory where as kids are in our schools learning, the writing improves by the time they get to the high school. Um, so that's, that's kind of consistent. Um, one thing I think we need to look into is looking at our interventions, right? Because it's school, failure is part of the learning process. But what I wanna make sure we have is that when students are struggling in writing, that there's a clear procedure that we have where they get put in an intervention class or their teacher pulls you know, a small group and does a mini lesson on, on what they were struggling with. So that way that learning process continues. <laughs> Um, and then finally, this is actually tricky because it's the link. Let's try the link real quick because um, I think this is something we really need to focus on. So, Joy, I'd be curious while you're looking that up to see the middle school broken out six, seventh, and eighth because it's hard to believe if we're at this percentage in writing that our freshmen. Yeah. Because these are obviously this is nine through twelve at ninety one percent, but I would be curious to see yeah. what those jumps are. We'll see if Eric can pull some magic. Yeah. Can you hear it too? 
Yeah. It's like back the same shit we did. I think our internet's back. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm just in my room then. Okay. Have you have broken down? Uh, sixth grade was at 63%. Uh, seventh grade was at 52%. And eighth grade was at 59%. So you're almost training backwards mm -hmm. at the middle school level. Yeah. And, and granted, uh, sixth grade, 63. Seventh grade, 52. And eighth grade, 59. So the students actually take three work samples um, over the course of the year. So we'll see and we'll be able to report back fall, winter, spring. But I think it comes back again to that talking about what, what are the interventions? So for example, if we're talking about our sixth graders and 63% pass, well, what are we doing for the other 37% that didn't pass? Um, is, is the real question. Um, so that's something where I think we can maybe kind of shore up our systems on to make sure those interventions are in place. Yeah, and I think you'd have to look at those three as well, you know, the fall to the winter to the spring, because if they're if they're gaining, that shows your interventions are working. And if yeah. they're not, it shows our interventions are wrong. But I think the other part is what are we using? What is the proficiency you're using? Is it just yeah. the letter grade? Like nope. you said. On those writing samples, um, those are actually scored with, uh, I believe, the Oregon State rubric. So the ODE puts out, here's the official writing rubric uh, mm -hmm. that's used. So there's usually four categories, like ideas and content, sentence fluency. And that's voice. used at the middle school and the high school. So we're using the same grading rubric. Uh, I believe they both use the Oregon Department of Ed. Um, I, I know, for example, with our English curriculum at the elementary school, it has a separate rubric, so we use that. But I, my understanding, and all I can double check that for you, is that they both use the Oregon Department of Ed rubric, which is what they'll see on the state assessment, um, OSAS. Okay, so maybe to, what did you use the C or better on? I C or better is the... English language arts, math, science, and social studies. Oh, the top. Okay. Yeah, so it's the ones that are in blue, yeah. just the writing. Okay, sorry. Okay. Were you able to break down the night through 12? Um, yeah, those are broken down as well. Yeah. Do you mind reading? I can pull that. What was your point? The nine percent of the class okay. by grade nine, 10, 11, 12. <laughs> The other category to just don't think you that in that class. Okay. What I can do is I can email that and break it out by the grade level if that's why I don't want to spend too much time just okay. kind of digging around if that works. Yeah, I know that. Great. Thank you. Jill. So then you don't have my phone case your that with this um, those are all linked if I can access those. What I'll do is um potentially because we're having techno technology issues, maybe we could pause and come back to it after another agenda item because it's I, I think that's the meat of our work and I want to discuss that tonight. Okay. Um particularly on our elementary reading. Um that's one thing where I think we really need to to, to put a lot of focus and energy in right now because I think it all we are not getting our kids on grade level by third grade. It, right. it impacts their science, their social studies, everything. So I think that's one thing that in, in working with Dr. Skinner going into the next year, that, that we put a lot of our money and our investment in that early literacy, K1, K3, 3 reading um, with this volunteer initiative with our high schoolers coming down. Um, because if we can't if we can't get them by third grade, they're playing catch up the rest of their academic career. So um, if we're good with that, I'll finish this off and then um, get the computer technology stuff figured out and maybe come back uh, after Anna and Leland's capacity projections, just because I want us looking at that data. Does that make sense? Are you? Um... Oh yes. After the we'll do it after the superintendent. Uh, 
introduction. So you're um, just going to come back to 1.1, 1 .1 basically. Sure. Yeah, if that works. Okay. Do you do you want to cover these other ones? Yeah, or? let's cover the other ones real quick. Or do you want to wait for all of it? Let's cover these, and then we can just come back for uh, mm -hmm. the academic piece. Okay. Um, so let's just go 1.2, complete a successful uh, math, science, and ELL curriculum adoption. Uh, the board just appointed uh, the, the committee members, so uh, it's still yellow. We'll hopefully be able to mark that green at our next update. Uh, and then... And sorry, Joel, uh, on your next update, can you kind of give us the layout? Because I'm a little reading the policy and how it works. It almost seems like maybe we're doing it backwards or creating more work for our teachers, I would think you'd want to utilize the committee that's appointed to do the legwork to bring the curriculums to the teachers. And it seems like we're having the teachers pilot multiple things to bring back to a committee. And I yeah. think if we tried to flip flop that, it would allow the community members to more or less do the legwork with Carrie, who then Carrie could bring a selected amount coming to the teachers to pilot as opposed to the teachers piloting numerous things. Yeah. I don't know. I, I just. It'd be worth exploring. One of the things it's, it's actually coincidence. You mentioned that, uh, Carrie and I were talking, I want to say last week that that policy, I, I, A, R, our curriculum adoption policy. I don't know the last time we've looked at it, but we thought maybe like over the summer, let's, let's look at that policy and these procedures to see uh, if it fits with what's best for our, our district um, and maybe propose some revisions to that. So um, that could be one of those things. I think it'd be helpful too, because that in turn might help kind of catch up when you have multiple deep people help, helping with deep diving or whatever it may look like. So we can get on track. Like I told Carrie, it's like, I don't know how, how she does it with these multiple, I mean, they're not small, adoption you know well, so it'd be nice to have one focus each year that they're due but it seems like we just kind of snowballed and we're just yeah. compiling yeah and so. i want to say the ode gives us it's like 13 a list of about 10 to 13 right it to depends. begin with um yeah i mean sometimes it's five and sometimes it's 22 ode approved curriculum yeah. so they go through a process with publishers that um submit their curriculum for an initial review. Yeah, yeah so I, I think that's maybe one of those policies that we look at over the summer just to say, okay. how can we make this better and this process better to, for our community, for our teachers and staff, and ultimately for our students? Okay. Hey, um, Joel. Let's shift. Joel. Yeah, go ahead. If, if we're going to do, if we're going to change the process, I just want to make sure that we get on the table that we really need to make sure we involve the teachers in that decision and we don't just make a decision for them. Teachers are very, very yeah. sensitive to curriculum. They're the ones who have to use it in the end. They kind of like sometimes testing it out before they have to start driving it. So so I would just ask that they be included in the conversation about any remake of the way we have been doing things. For sure. And, and I think, you know, I'm looking at Mr. and Mrs. Bates back there. Yeah. The people that are with the students all day generally know what works for students and, and what doesn't. So yeah, I think teacher voice is a huge huge uh, stakeholder in this. So thanks for highlighting that. Mm -hmm. um, let's jump 1.5, uh, enhance the performing arts program and increase student participation. Um, you'll see in your packet, you've got uh, the, the numbers from trimester two of the number of students that were in our performing arts classes at the middle school and high school. I saw, I want to say a number of our board members at uh, Steen's Pillar did the Little Mermaid uh drama performance we had some awesome brother students um showing us their performing arts skills tonight and then the high school also did um a midsummer night's dream performance um i wasn't able to go to that one but i heard amazing reviews so um we are reassembling our performing arts improvement team um our first meeting is april 18th with uh, mr dunaway mr schuler and miss mienta um our choir teacher um so uh, that team is going and we'll set like a one and three year plan for improving our performing arts program. Um, let's look here. The last uh, yellow here is ensure uh, horizontal and vertical alignment through consistent levels of support services and quality curriculum. Uh, we've checked with our math consultant, Shannon McCaw, that our math curriculum that we're adopting 
is vertically aligned so that students that the elementary curriculum um, or the middle school curriculum builds off the elementary and high school builds off the middle school to work on our vertical alignment. Um, that link, that horizontal staffing alignment is, uh, we'll take you to a chart uh, that has our elementary schools and how many, um, how many aides are at each, how many general education teachers, how many secretaries. So that helps us um, to see where, where we're, we're spot on and maybe where we're off on our proportions of staffing. So that's something that Jay Ann and I will work on between now and uh, the next report in July. I've talked for maybe 30 minutes straight. So oh, great. Any questions or anything, we'll come back to 1.1. We'll get this computer figured out and um, bring that up after uh, Dr. Spinner's introduction later in the meeting. Cool. I, I wanted to mention about the vertical alignment that that also includes a component of allowing discrete sets of staff to meet with one another across the buildings so that we have high school social studies staff meeting with middle school social studies staff meeting with elementary school staff to find out what's working, what isn't working and share information back and forth to improve the system vertically. Mr. Cooper, you're always looking out for me. When I look at my next steps, it says August and September, we'll do a uh, vertical alignment PD uh, and we'll put that in our professional development calendar. So that way the high school staff, social studies department is meeting with the middle school. So yeah, we'll, we'll get that covered. Thank you. With that, I think we needed, uh, we needed an action on uh, to make sure that we can go speak with our community groups, um, recruiting volunteers. Um, I'm not sure what kind of motion we'd look for in that. Uh, I think, again, would more or less need to be specific to where, from who's going where, yes. and what the representation would be, or what, you know, like the volunteers, but I think it would have to be pretty specific. Yeah. So what if this, what if um, we worked behind the scenes and came up with a plan and then brought a motion to the board in May and we can start May, June, July recruiting volunteers for uh, starting in the fall? Would that work? Yeah, that sounds that better, okay. yeah. <laughs> awesome. We'll uh, bring that to you in May. Okay, so we'll come back to finish up the strategic plan report, but we'll move on to Leland and Anna for our modular follow-up report. Raymond's up here. Um, we're going to present both agenda topics 3.3 and 3.4 together because it's kind of a combined conversation. And so we put that all into one presentation. Show my friends in. There you go. Okay. And it's the right view. Yeah, showing the full slide. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think I'm not seeing this how to press. Um, in the March board meeting, we asked the board to approve the purchase of modular buildings for an expenditure up to uh, $1 million. And um, you did approve that, so thank you because we need to get going. And you also asked that we provide some deeper detail on the um, modular buildings. And then there was a question about some pillar and some other questions that come up since. So we try to put all that information together into this um, presentation. So to start, I just want to um, show um, the way that our three in town elementary schools work barnes butte and crooked river um they have a zone map so all students in our just in our that go to school in prangle not brothers or Kalina, but the, the prangle students will either fall into the barnes butte zone or the crooked river zone um barnes butte and crooked river have to serve all students that are in those zones 
no matter how big the population gets, no matter how much we grow. Um, Steam's pillar was opened so that we could reduce the craft sizes as we were experiencing growth. And originally, we were when we closed down that school um, that is now Steam's pillar, we were thinking it would never be a school again. It was just going to be. We didn't know what, sell it or turn it into a district office or something. And then once we started growing um, at Barnsby and Crooked River, we decided to open Steen's Pillar. We did a remodel there and it really reduced the class sizes at Barnsby and Crooked River to um, the levels that we find more appropriate. Um, at Steen's Pillar, there's a, we call it a cap on enrollment. It's not you know, a, a legal cap or a policy cap or anything. It's just kind of a target cap that we have. Um, and they also don't have SPED programs. They do have students who have special needs who are on an IEP. So we have a special ed teacher there and special ed um, instructional assistant or assistant. Um, but they don't have the same high needs, the, what they call the ILC, the Intensive Learning Center, and SLC, which is Structured Learning Center. Those are the more high needs. Um, programs. We don't, we just don't have that at Steve's Pillar. And Steve's Pillar already has four modular buildings and have been there for a while. And who's occupying the four modular buildings at Steve's Pillar? I think Grizzly Owl has one, and then Steve's Pillar has three. They did a move, so I think we backwards on that. But... <clears throat> and at the time that the school was not open, we remodeled what used to be the library and turn it into the technology department. So right now, the technology department is in Steen's Pillar, as well as Print Shop, which is in one of the classrooms. Um, there's also a nutrition services office there, a psychiatrist evaluation office, and the maintenance building is on that site. In previous bond discussions, we did an analysis and determined that we do have a need for a central services building, and we have actually planned to figure out a way to build a central services building, take technology out of Steen's Pillar and put it into central services, move the print shop into central services, and have maintenance and facilities there and the nutrition services office there as well. Um, but that would require a bond. If we were able to do that, that would be a much better solution for Steen's Pillar than adding modulars at Steen's Pillar, because then they'd have actual building space. So I just want to point out that modular buildings are not ideal. They're, now keep in mind, th this is just a Google search of, of um, buildings. These aren't the ones we're gonna buy. They look a little bit better than this, but they still are just modular buildings. They don't have the same siding as the regular school. They don't, or bricks or whatever it is. They don't have the same roof line, they don't have the same colors, all that. And so they definitely look like an add-on. Um, a better solution really would be if you're growing enough, you would build a brand new school. Or you would remodel your addition, uh, your existing schools by adding additions that look like they were there to begin with. You know, they've got the same brickwork or whatever it is that it would look like if you were to add on to Barnesview or add on to the River um, or Steen's Pillar to make them look like, so that the students don't really know that they're going somewhere different than the building that everybody else is in. Um, but if you don't have a big bond anywhere in sight, um, and you're running out of space, a modular is a good feasible option financially, just because of you can come up with, well, we're lucky, it just so happens we're able to come up with the money to do this, but we couldn't come up with the money to do major remodels. A remodel addition is just, that's many, many millions of dollars. So that's just not within our grasp. So that's why um, when we started looking at this, that's where we landed on the modular buildings. Um, all right, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is you asked for capacity information. Um, right now I have the total enrollment at each school is that first gray line there. I have a target capacity there. These are not the capacity that the architects would tell you when they're building the building because they would assume you've got 35 kids per classroom and every single classroom is full of kids and, you know, they go off of building codes and things like that. Um, what I looked at is, okay, if you didn't really want more than a certain number of kindergartners, first graders, second graders, et cetera, and you had to reserve some rooms that 
would not have the same number of students in them because their special education, the intensive learning and structured learning centers would not have the same number of students. They have a lot lower. So I, those are the target capacity numbers I put in there. 284 is the number that is the target cap for um, Steen's pillar. I just got to update. Steen's pillar is in three of the four mods. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> so I took the total enrollment here and took this total enrollment and then I said, well, what would happen if we did if we had a 2% increase next year? It would be this number. And then if the following year we had another 2% increase just across the board, we're not really reaching what that target capacity is. Capacity really isn't the issue that we're trying to solve. If you if you look at just the individual class sizes, so like just take kindergarten, for example. Um, Barnes View has 23, 22, 19, and 21. Crooked Herbal has 22, 19, 19, 21, et cetera. And then you look at first grade and you see Barnes View has 17, 18, 18, and 16 in first grade. That's where your capacity is. But all the new students coming in aren't going to be in first grade. Some will, but it's not like Barnes View is all going to just fill up with first graders perfectly into those slots. Um, so really what the, I'm oh, sorry. What the issue is, is that the ratio of students coming in who have special needs or who are highly impacted is much higher than it used to be. And it continues to be every year surprising to us because we always expect it. We work closely with the ESD and we know who the incoming, that the incoming kindergartners are going to come in with, you know, we have a certain number of highly impacted, a certain number of high needs, et cetera. And then more people come in from out of state or out of just out of the area, and we just have more of those students than what we expected or what we had before. So a classroom that may hold 28 third graders just perfectly fine, that same space, if you put six or eight highly impacted kids in there, it's unmanageable. So that's the issue that we're facing. And that's this year in the fall, what made us really start to look at these modules. And how many of those are at each school? So right now, Barnes Butte is the only of the three elementary schools that has an intensive learning center. It was a decision that was made a few years ago to, to try to um, take the, a specialized program. And so no matter which zone a student lives in, if they're in the ILC, they go to Barnes Butte. And that's grown so much. And what was your question? How many are there? I don't actually know. I think we know how many are there. Yeah. How many students are we asking about modules? How many students are in the aisle? Nine or ten currently. But that number is projected Field? to double next year. Just at Barnes Field. So so we're adding that program to Crooked River because we want to be able to provide the same level of service at Crooked River that we are at Barnes Butte. And Barnes Butte doesn't have the capacity to double. They're over. I mean, that, that program realistically needs to be about six or eight. We're not near 10 now. And so with the increase of incoming kinders, um, again, you know, the separate between the two schools, it's just a lot more, you know, high intensive needs are coming our direction from the kindergarten level. So can you, there was uh, some questions and social media buzz about um, saying that the, um, the modulars were going to be just for the highly impacted students if they were they were being brought on just for them to go in there and then there was some uh, concern well some of them are dry and don't have bathrooms and how are the then you're going to be separating the highly impacted students out there and um, so can you clarify there was a lot of confusion around that and I went back and watched the board meeting and I was confused again as well. Um, so can you clarify, like, or do you know exactly like, what the modulars are going to be used for? Is it going to be used for the highly impacted students or other students going to go out there and then they're going to be brought into the, um, to the main building? Your timing is perfect because that's our next slide. Great. <laughs> so so what you see is Crooked River's mod up there. So that's going to be two classrooms of fifth grade. With no restroom. With no restroom in there. So, so what will I don't know how it works. 
It can use the mask right. though. So the, if you look, if you look at the bottom drawing where you see the big blue X, that's mm -hmm. approximately where that building is going to sit. So the building will have um it will have a ramp on, on the building side and it's going to have another set of stairs on the other side. Uh, on the building side, they will have access to the building. We'll put door access on there, and then they will go right up to the hallway and use those restrooms for that red, that, that orange dot is right there. Um, then what they're, what they're going to do over there, I, I think, is they're going to, they're going to get another intensive learning uh, center over there. So... There's some rooms where we're going to have to actually add a door between a couple of rooms and expand all of the all of the special needs programs that are over there at Crooked River. We don't have any at Crooked River right now. Right. So well, we don't have we don't have ILC. ILC over there. We do have SPED over there. <laughs> what else do you have over there? There's like we have life skills, but we just don't have that ILC classroom, which will be inside the building, not in module. Yeah. I'm just going to say that again louder <laughs> for the owl. Yeah. The ILC will be in the building with the modular, or with the bathroom. Sorry. <laughs> Can we rewind? The ILC will be in the building itself with a bathroom, not in a modular. We're going to move fifth, two fifth grade classrooms to the modulars. And then there's a several shuffling things that they're working out that in the end, the ILC will be in the building. That's Crooked River. And you're projecting how many kids at Crooked River next year? For that ILC classroom, right around nine. And then what are you projecting at Barn Q? Nine also. So is a classroom that we have at these buildings adequate for those students? Um, I mean, it depends on each individual kid's needs. And so, you know, our team looks at the different needs and the staffing concerns. And so I've been meeting with um, Joel and, and Anna and our various staff members to see how, uh, how that's going to look. Granted, kindergarten registration is coming up. And so we have our projections and we're you know, obviously going to make sure that those projections are correct and then staff accordingly. Well, what about, I mean, what are you doing building wise? We pretty much do just about anything we have to do to support that. So we do have one room where we're going to cut a chunk of wall up and put a door in there so they can actually access between one room to the next room. Um, and that's going to be kind of down on that far south end. I don't know if you can actually see it on. Yeah, it'd be right about where your mouth is at, right in the general area down there. And so, is that funding coming out of this million dollars, or where's the funding uh, to do was, this? I was planning to probably do that and some other support stuff for them. That'll come out of the maintenance reserve. And then what are we doing at Barnes Butte? They already have the ILC, so they don't need upgrades or improvements for that, or? Right, so the Barnes Butte mod will have restrooms in it, we'll have two restrooms in it, two classrooms, two restrooms. They want to put their student success center out there. So right now that's actually been, uh, they've been using the, one of the kindergarten rooms, I believe. And those students are, they can become, they're not SPED students, but they can become, Disregulated at times. So putting them out there makes actually really good sense. Um, that building is going to actually set out where that where the blue cross is up there, which is on the far north side of the of the gym. And then it since it has uh, restrooms in it, we really don't need to worry about where which restrooms are going to use inside the building. It has all the infrastructure that we actually need uh, to support that program in there. And then she, uh, or I can't remember where they were going to, uh, they're messing around with, with movement of some of the SPED stuff and the title rooms over there. Um, so I know that uh, where the title room currently is, that's moving out of there. I think it's going to actually move into where the Student Success Center is now. And then they're going to use that other room for another special ed classroom. All right. 
So right now the title room is in the same pod where students are having outbursts and I don't know what the right terminology is, but it's very difficult. Breaks, break room. Yeah. Dysregulated. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, loud noises and things like that. And so they're in the title room to learn how to read and need to concentrate. So moving that to a different location will be very helpful. On this one, is it fenced in? Is it completely fenced in? Well, they're all completely fenced in. They're in the back where all the fences, there's six foot fence around, around both. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. And I'm, a, I'm going to safely assume that on this particular one, there will be some sort of radios, something that, where they can get well, a hold of a we're the office. We're kind of tied into the, the, the public address system. Okay. Yeah, if they want radios, we can actually supply radios out there too, but public address systems a lot more uh, they'll say than we lose. Casey, the assistance. Okay, so the cost of the buildings. So Barnes View, that building is a wet building, and the total cost is right there, 254765 And then the dry building that's going in at Crooked River is 237490 So that's, when you look at those two, that's really close to a half a million. So that's half a million. The other half a million that we're looking at, will cover all those things that you see down in the yellow school. So all the infrastructure, all the alien, all the things that actually have to go into putting those buildings in so that we can use them and make sure we need all the things. And then the total cost, I don't even know. <laughs> Nice touch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to address um, where the million dollars is coming from. Um, um, so at, in September, we were closing out the books from 2223 and transferred money into the general fund. Whenever we have general fund savings, which we have, we had uh, a lot of savings last year from just unfilled positions and some things that just were unanticipated and we had additional revenue that we weren't anticipating. So at the end of the year, we said, okay, there's, we needed this target. We're going to be doing better than that target. So some of that excess is going to go in to plan for the future. We try to do that every year and um, we don't budget to put anything into the maintenance reserve. And so this has been our, our method to make sure that we get money into the maintenance reserve. It's been working really well. So we moved some money into the maintenance reserve. Um, we put money in there for just usual facilities maintenance needs. And we also set aside some money for the CCS modular because that lease is ending. And so we have, we have to figure out what we're going to do with that. Um, so there was quite a bit of money that went into the maintenance reserve. Around that same time, the principals at Crooked River and Barnes Street were really sounding the alarm as to what was happening in the special education area and looking at the incoming kindergartners for next year. And so that's when Leland met with Joel and me and um, Eric and I don't know, remember the Bobby. superintendent. Okay, yeah, a bunch of different people from Fiends Pillar, Crooked River. Barnes Butte to try to figure out what do we need to plan for? Uh, because we don't want to get into next year and then suddenly just be in a, a worse panic, right? We need to start planning for next year now. So um, during that time around September, October, we started talking about what do we think we're going to need? And we came up with the idea of let's use some of the maintenance reserve money to purchase modular buildings for them. Um, and then also around that same time, we were seeing that our state school fund revenue, our interest revenue, our property tax revenue, all these things are probably going to come in higher than what we're, we're expecting. So let's plan these a maintenance reserve. And then as we continue out through this year, if we are able to, at the end of this year, if we're, if we're exceeding our targets in the general fund, we'll do a transfer out again into the maintenance reserve to cover that. You can see our interest earnings this year alone are almost totally covering above the budget. They're almost seven hundred. They're they're almost they're over seven hundred thousand dollars. So we're almost 
covering the million dollar purchase alone, just out of interest earnings being on the budget. So, um, so in November, we went to the board and just said, hey, we're just giving you a heads up. We want to make sure that you know that we're thinking about this modular building because we know that modular buildings are not ideal. And we just wanted to tell you why we were doing it, give you the heads up so that we, you know, you could have time to ask questions and we could gather information, et cetera. And so I just wanted you to know that we weren't, when we came to you in March, it wasn't just a sudden thing at that point. And that we really were not just magically finding million dollars for something we didn't plan for. Um, so after that time, then Leland has been working with vendors to get the information, to get everything going. And um, we've got, you know, with something like that, we have to get bids or work off of a state contract or something like that. So, and you have to find a vendor who actually has a modular that they in stock or that they can build in time. Yeah, these were these were already pre-built. So. so that's where we're headed and we're gonna be on track assuming everything works out. So does Cricket River have an SCS or SSC? Do, does Cricket River have an, S have an SLC? Yeah. yeah, they do. And how many students are in that one? Um, like currently, and it's projected to be around 10 next year. And I think it's roughly around that number right now. And what's our projection? So is the nine, so what's our projection for Barnes View? For which one? For the SLC. It's around 12 next year. One thing we could do, um, just throwing out bad ideas, is perhaps bring Grant here in May to give an update on SPED projections, SLC, ILC, ERC, um, lots of acronyms, uh, and it's important that we we all know, and, and he does a great job keeping it all straight for us, so maybe we could have Grant give kind of an overview presentation on on SPED and all these different programs because they get, they get jumbled very easily. We'll just, yeah. Nope, and then, uh, so what else is in Steen's Pillar, Anna? You said the print shop, Grizzly Mountain Home Link. Technology. Nutrition. 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 The, well, the nutrition services central kitchen is in there, and that probably won't change. That works really well. Um, but the nutrition service office, yeah, the couple of staff members would move to a central. Like that. Oh, in there. oh, yeah. A psych, a psych. And you said the print shop uses one classroom. Grizzly Mountain is only using one modular, or do they use classrooms inside of Steam's pillar? They have classrooms inside too. They have everything on that west end, on the far west end, like where the classrooms. office is from the front door. When you walk in, everything on the left hand side is Grizzly Mountain. From the side off third or the side off first? Southwest yeah. corner on, on the south building. So how many buildings? Well, how many fifth grade was in there? So there's, I want to say there's ten total classrooms in there. So, so they have all ten. They're classrooms. probably used. They're oh. probably using six. No, the Steen Spiller does use some of the classrooms uh, on the on the east side of that building. Why was there a um, a fifth grade Steen Spiller classroom that's back out to the mobs? Do you know why that? Was? I don't know why. We can find that. We can get that up. Can we get an update on that? Right there? No, I the size of the room. Yeah. The size of the room and the modular is bigger than the size of the classroom and things like that. So both fourth grades move out there. Is it a split class or just a solid fifth grade? Because only one of the fifth grade classes got moved out to a modular. Mm -hmm. And then class. Two, Sorry. two fourth grade. Mm -hmm. Is that so Grizzly Mountain could have classrooms in the building or why? They did do a swap with some of the Grizzly Mountain families. Um, we'll get, let's, let us yeah, get you some information can, on why. The they had reasons, but I couldn't. I... And then I don't know if Grant wants to answer this. What, what do these rooms or areas look like for the ILCs and SLCs of these kids progress into like the middle school and the high school. So like what are the what are the rooms look like at the middle school and the high school? 
Well, I'm just concerned if we have this much growth, as Anna was saying, if you have individuals that move in that aren't the incoming kindergartners that you know, sure. what are our other, you know, the middle school and high school? Are we going to come fall and need modulars there? Okay. Are they at capacity? I mean, it sounds like Barnes Butte's been over capacity. Sure. So yeah, they were they were over capacity. Yeah. And, and, well, they're right at like right just a little bit over capacity right now, but they would absolutely be if we didn't have split the ILC program for next year. Okay. Um, for the middle school, I mean, markets could probably speak a little bit better about space uh, and capacity. Or so the name with the projections of fifth graders coming into sixth graders, our sped numbers, our sixth grade sped caseload is currently at high 20s for our sixth grade uh, ERC. Next year, it's projected to be close to 50. Yeah, so I we know. have been working with Anna and Grant on allocation of an additional um, half time staff member. So we are in process with that space isn't as big of a, a need at the middle school okay. um, with the, the six mods that we do have out back are very important for us to keep okay. um, not just for um, gen ed classes we have three of them that are full-time gen ed classes and then others are used periodically throughout the day for electives um, and then possible reading title improvement stuff going on so um, spacing isn't as big of a deal for for us with, with that growth. Okay, so with 30 projects coming in, you have the space you feel like adequately for that at the middle school. And I don't I don't see anyone from the high school. Do you know anything about the high school thing? No, I don't. Okay. Space wise, I can't speak to that. We have a lot of space over there. They've got Two pretty good sized rooms for sure. And then there's a mod out back that we we emptied out this year that if we had to, we can they can use that mod out there if want to. What's going on with the space that they were originally going to do the child care facility? Is that vacant or it's almost turned into a child care facility? It's almost finished. So we have another mod empty besides the child care one at the high school. Yes. So then what's your projections? We just have the two mods. That's our only projections. We don't have down the road from that. Well, no, I think that's, yeah. Yeah, that's it. And then can you go back to your target numbers, Anna? I had a question, some questions on them. As she's pulling that up, uh, the fire alarm in Scott's hotel started going off, so he had to evacuate. So he will return. With, yeah. So when you say our target capacity, that's you saying classrooms with an adequate 28 students. Am I understanding what you're saying? So right now, our total enrollment is 511. But if you put 28 kids in each room inside of the school, 580 would fit. I assumed 20 at kindergarten, bigger number at first grade, et cetera. So yeah. And then I assumed that some of the classrooms, like the pretty much the entire sped pod would not have that number of kids. So your 2% increase you have on there that moves us to 547, is that your anticipated growth for next year or why the 2%? I am going to propose a budget that's 1.9% increase. 2% is what we, I think actually this year, we were 2% over budget. So and when was sure. Barnes Butte built? When was it actually finished? 2015. Okay. Right, Mr. Bates? You're correct. We opened that school. My daughter was It's a nice school. So, I guess my only concern would be Crooked River is still going to come 
I mean, at next year, you're, you're kind of at capacity, even with without the modular. I mean, with the modular. For what the use is, correct? Because we That's would the then remove two class. Okay. Yeah. And I what, mean, you're still. What are we doing in that? If, yeah. If you had a two percent increase, you're right. still you're really close to my target capacity. And again, I think you know someone else might come along and say this is too low, and and they're not going to be all in one grade level. Right. So it's it is possible that you may have a little bit of growth in every classroom, and it doesn't have an impact on your space. At some point, it will. Right. So I do think we need to be looking long term of what do we want to do with the river with the next bond. If we want to some, or do we want to start looking at another elementary school? I don't think our numbers district wide are big enough quite yet because I started thinking about that. But someday we'll probably need to move another elementary school or something, some other way of adding on to the existing school. Once your schools get super big. You can't get them all through the lunchroom in an, in an adequate amount of time. You can't get them all PE and music and all that. But we're not, it's not, today's not the day, but it is probably coming. Which is a good problem. It's a good problem that we're not there. Contracting. We're in the only places that are, and it's not losing students. Yeah. I, I'll just voice that I just, you know, January, the board kind of decided it's not ready to run a large bond. So my concern would be um, we probably need to look at a short term goal or something for Crooked River if our growth continues at 2%. I don't know if that's. Steadily, I can't remember what you said, but it's been steadily over the last few years, but um, because we wouldn't want to be in a predicament come fall where now you have, you know, you don't have somewhere to put kids. And hopefully maybe in a year, this board will be ready to start, you know, in January of 2024, this board wasn't ready, maybe January or maybe December of 2024 or something, you know, soon they'll be ready to start getting that bond committee together and start talking about, okay, what do we want to do next? That would be, you know, once you start, once you decide, you know, the bond committee will take to the board a uh, recommendation to go out for a bond. Once you do that, it can be three years before you open the doors of a new facility. Well, that's what I'm saying. So, I mean, even if you did a, a quick turnaround to start a large bond, it, if the, increase in students continues at two percent in three years you won't have room at cricket river so that's why I would you just have, have either you would have larger class sizes right or what one option we would have is if if we were able to find a spot for grizzly mountain that was outside of Kingskiller right. killer that worked better for them we could potentially increase to three grades per three classes per grade level at students pillar which would again relieve some of the the class size yeah, we're probably gonna have to maybe put some of those options on on our list of topics. If we could get some of that stuff together, I think it would help provide for expansion in the next few years till you can really get a large ticket bond going and you know running because I wasn't sure if I was reading your numbers right. So and I mean Steen's Steen's pillars on the same boat, it just can't help alleviate anything. From the other two schools, like you said, without utilizing more classrooms within that building. So um, we need to probably have a better short term idea for you, Anna. And we went, I don't know, going anywhere else. Here, but. It might not sound like it right now, but this is a great problem for us to be troubleshooting and navigating. I'd say 90% of Oregon school districts are <laughs> struggling with enrollment drops. Right. Uh, and we're really fortunate in Crook County where. Uh, we are seeing enrollment in increases. So although difficult, it, it's a good thing for us to be navigating. Any other questions for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So are you good, Joe, or you want me to keep going? Uh, I'm going to go after 4.2. Okay. 
So we'll move on to the school board update. So we put um, this, the bond committee back on, um, and I'm, I'm gonna put it over to Cheyenne. Um, we, um, we appointed the committees at the beginning of the year, um, not really understanding what we were gonna be doing this year. And um, so I know Cheyenne wanted to speak in regards to the bond committee and um, a potential vacancy on that committee. So, yeah, so I just wanted to, um, I would like to recuse myself from the bond committee um, after attending the OSBA bond conference in February of this year. Um, it became ev evident to me that we have a lot of work to do. Um, the current bond that we have on for May was thrown together very fast with no support or promotion. Um, and while our facilities are in great need of repair, um, to me, it seems like a Band-Aid on a hemorrhage. Um, and I would like to take the time to gather information from constituents, community members, students, staff, um, as to what needs to be fixed. Um, I think if we ask them, I'm more on the, um, I, I'd like to be on the radar for the big bond. Um, this just kind of like came out of nowhere. And when we originally started the bond committee, uh, we were looking at doing a, a big rollout like in 2027 when Facebook and Apple and the taxes are rolling off or other bond is expiring. And if we keep on going to the taxpayers and asking them for a little bit of money at a time, it's not really what like we, we do. We need new schools. How many times can we repatch the middle school flat roof? And we need to look at like big options. Um, I also feel like if the taxpayers are footing the bill for this, that we need to go out to them, to the Democratic Party, to the Republican Party, to the Kiwanis, to different, um, to parents and say, what is it that's important to you? What do you want to see? Um, I know that within this school, you guys have a list of things that are important, but, but the taxpayers are paying for it. And so we need to find out what they want to see long term um, for, uh, for what they're paying for. So I would uh, like to remove myself from this, the bond committee at this time. And I believe that we uh, re-up the bond committees every year. Is that correct? Um, so I, I, I don't want to be on this bond for me. So I would say when this, when Cheyenne had brought this up, I don't know that we necessarily need a committee for this bond because it's, already Anna submitted the paperwork, it's going to the ballot. We missed the whole, Anna provided a very detailed, I mean, step-by-step, step, it's in four boxes. I mean, she really has us dialed out and we we pretty much went from box one to, to the end of four. So I am not, I, I know you two are a bond committee people, so I don't know, Jen, if you had any plans to do anything extra for this bond because it came so quickly or um if we need another committee member now or if we want to wait in a year or two when we have needs to run a, a committee with the bond so right now if cheyenne recuses herself it leaves just you yeah on the bond yes, and i don't know if you two had any plans I mean, the, the measure comes up next month. Yes, it so does. I'm not sure that there's any work that can be done in the short week we have. And that, it sounds like, was Cheyenne's concern. So I think, Jen, I think both of us were really impressed with the Crestwell, um, you know, the presentations at the bond committee. And when I was uh, appointed to the bond committee, my thought was we need to do something big like this, and if we go to the taxpayers for, for several different bonds, we're not gonna, you know, they the way that the OSBA training um, explain things that, you know, they, they failed and they passed and they fail. And so I don't wanna run the risk of not, we need a lot of things, not just a few little things for maintenance. And so um, I feel like this is a setup for failure because there has been absolutely no promotion um, of it at all. So we already and have so, the paperwork done and sent. Yeah, so it can go on going. it can go on it. But we have not, I I mean I haven't I know that staff cannot go out and promote it, but they can provide information. And so there's been no information updated um, on our Facebook page. There's been no 
nothing put out on social media. And so people are going to go to vote and they don't even know what it is, you know, and what, what our needs are. And so that, that bothers me that it hasn't been promoted and I just don't want my name on it. So I'm the lone wolf standing on this bond committee, which is fine. Um, you know, me being brand new to this as well, went to the bond conference in February, learned a ton. And at that point in time, our bond was ready to go. I mean, it's going on the May ballot. And I agree, I have not seen anything on social media. I was waiting for somebody to say, okay, this, this is our next step. This is what we're gonna do, this is what we need to do, you know, and all these steps. But I don't feel like jumping ship is the correct term for me. So here I am representing the bond committee and I'll keep doing that, whatever that looks like. Um, I thought we were gonna put a video out about the problems that we were having at CCMS. Um, you know, to kind of show people, hey, this is what's happening. This is why we're asking for a bond. And I haven't seen that, so I'm not sure where that fell through the cracks. Um, but it sounds like we're still doing a bond. So thank you. And I guess so the, we're going to go from there. So it would have to be you going to Leland. Leland can't promote it, so you'd have to go to Leland, get the video, and you would do that. Or unless or the I committee re, would. If so I this, recuse myself, if Steve or Scott, somebody else wants to be on the bond committee with Jen. Um, but, so you don't have to be on, or if we don't need a bond committee because the bond's already going. Um, I'm looking to somebody who's went through this before to help guide this because I'm apparently, you know, I here I am. Help me. <laughs> help me, Anna. So the bond committee. Um, also known as Long Range Facilities Planning Committee, works long in advance of taking a recommendation to the board to put a measure on the ballot. So what we did this time is just we, we knew the board appointed, we had a list of committees and that was one of the committees. Um, and the name was changed to Bond Committee. It used to be called Long Range Facilities Planning Committee, but it was changed to Bond Committee I think, just because it made more sense. To, um, to all, which is great, um, because it's maybe this is more. And then as the year progressed, it became apparent that we really weren't ready to start getting that long range facilities committee together. That's a big committee of lots of community members, lots of stakeholders, um, and pulling them all together to talk about what do you, what do you want to do if we do the big bond, you know? And then you kind of go through the process of, deciding what's actually going to be on the ballot and then you take that to the board and say board we're recommending that you go out for a bond measure for these things after that the the board as individuals can advocate for the bond or advocate against the bond your your choice um then what would happen is theoretically there would be people who were in support of passing the bond and they would form a political action committee or a PAC. That can be made up of board members or not. A lot of times um, board members are the drivers of the political action committee, but that's completely separate from the district. The district employees um, can provide information and often the PAC will ask the district for information. But this time, what we did is that we just said, you know, this bond makes so much sense to at least us as staff. We think it will speak for itself we know you're not ready for a full, big 77 million or whatever bond, but we've got water coming down the walls in the middle school and places where we need roofs. If we, if you approve us going out for this bond, we're not going to ask you to do anything, any kind of advocacy or anything, because we just think that $6 million of state money matching just speaks for itself. And people can vote for the bond or against the bond, obviously. But at least we asked. So that if someone says, why do you still have water coming down the middle school with gym walls? We can say, well, that's not something we can pay for out of operations. You know, no, no business goes out and does capital improvements out of regular operations. They go get a, a loan of some kind. And that's basically what a bond is. It's just a loan. It's a big enough dollar amount that we just need to get, we just need to go into debt to do it. And the way that 
the way that we can do that, the cheapest way that school districts can do that in, in Oregon and probably most states is to do tax exempt bonds because we can get interest rates that are three to five percentage points lower than what you would do if you just went to a bank and got a loan. Well so that's why that mechanism is in place in Oregon for the property tax outside of Measure 5 and Measure 50 for the school bonds is so that schools can do these major capital improvements for things that operations won't cover. Were the ESSER funds allowed to be used for major capital improvements? Yes. And who decided, like if you had water pouring down the middle school walls and there was no specifications on where you use the ESSER funds, who prioritized what that then? I think, and that is my issue, is that if you have massive issues like water pouring in, which was solved, and you went over and did something maybe that wasn't as mandatory as you know the water pouring in. That's my concern is that I'm I'm elected by the taxpayers. My job is to my constituents and I work for the public. And so when they, you know, when you when you have money that's given to you or you're asking them for money, it's important that, that they're able to be involved in the process of what that money is being used for. Because it doesn't seem like to me it was a good sort you know good use of resources to get $10 million in ESSER funds. And if you have water pouring down, you know, there's a major area here, but use the money for something else. And then, you know, it, it's, it just seemed to me like it was a sink or swim, like, we, you know, maybe we mismanaged a little bit of money in the past and like, we need to do this now, now, now. And there, and then there was no follow through, like there's absolutely been no promotion. So I completely yeah. support your decision to be off the committee. I think that, you know, if you're, if you're uncomfortable, I think you need to do what's right for you. And so if the, but I think what I'm trying to help with is if the committee doesn't know, or if the board doesn't know what does the committee need to do without you being on there, can they still function? The answer is yes, you can still function because you really have no duties until we start talking about what do we want to do next. Okay. Three, three people can't do that. That would be Scott being two out of four. I would say have a conversation with Scott. He's been through it before. Okay. I haven't been through it before, so I can't. Yeah, me neither. We're a little help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anna does have a check box. I don't know what you call that, but it's got boxes and it says the process, but we totally missed the whole process for this one. Um, but Anna does have like a, a like a process laid out yes. or step by I don't know what you want to call that. Okay, and, have a coffee over. and yes, we did do this fast. This is something that we had we didn't have water pouring down the gym before. We've had leaks that we've been able to manage throughout the middle school, but a little smash. when this happened, that's when we said we have to do something. What can we do? And oh, at the same time, we have a six million dollar grant that we applied for and been awarded. And so that's why we did this guy. So I'm sorry that it went really, really fast. And you know, it's it's one of those things if it doesn't pass because it went too fast, then okay, but at least like I said, at least we asked, at least we tried. We pretty much missed to leave six million dollars sitting on the table. Exactly. Okay. Okay. How how long have we known about the six million dollar match? Did we know before February? We knew it. When did we apply? I think uh, December. I think December fifteenth. Yeah, December fifteenth was when that one was submitted. Then we, we applied. Find out like in a couple of weeks after after the submission. So it was January second. Yeah. But being through bonds before, if you run a small bond and then turn around in another year and a half and try and run a big bond. From what I understand from the OSBA training is that you're not going to probably get both response because the people are going to say, well, you just asked us for a bunch of money last year. A lot of times they don't understand, you know, with, with the matching. And even if we have the matching six million, it doesn't, it's it's pennies in the bucket for what we need to do for mm -hmm. our schools. So I, I would rather take the chance and pouring all of our effort into that huge bond where we can actually improve and you know taxpayers they don't they're not going to see the you know flat roof at the middle school being patched for the thousandth time they want to see new facilities and 
you know, um, turf fields and new buildings and new elementary schools and things that they can say, well, that's where our money went, you know. So that that's my reason. I don't know if we need to do an action to remove me or if I can just remove myself. So the policy on the procedure around that, yeah. I believe, uh, I believe we did a motion back in August to appoint. Um, maybe we can just leave it as a vacancy for now and come back in May if we have to do a motion or anything to appoint someone new. Yeah, I don't think we have to do a motion to for her to recuse herself. I think, like we said, we need the action to appoint someone. But Leland, where are we at on the long range facility committee for you? Well, because we're doing this bond like we are now. We aren't doing anything with the long range facility committee because Sweet. that long range facilities committee. Uh, I mean, if we don't pass this time, we've got one more shot to pass it. And I mean, we could put a long range facilities committee, get them back together for a November election if we wanted to, um, to try and get them to do some of that work. So, do we, do you, where are you at on the actual forming of the committee? Do we? We we stopped what we were doing okay. when we put the, when we went out for this bond. So the so like when you guys when the board decided that we were going to go out for this bond, I did not pursue the long range facilities committee because there was no work for them to really do at that point. It was really when the board said in January that they weren't ready for a big bond when we said we don't need to do anything with long range facility. <laughs> So I say, with all the gusto, what's already in motion, let's get this thing passed, right? What do I need to do to work with you, Leland, to get from something from Jason and Eric's help getting a video out, showing people what has been transpiring, and that we are getting, you know, a matching grant of $6 million that's free, and this is how this can help. I mean, we're already in motion. They started working on some stuff last week for promotion. Perfect. We okay. have a website that's, I, I'm not sure if it's live at this moment. Very it's very close. Okay. So let me know what you need from me. Let's work together. Let's get, I mean, we're in motion. Let's hammer this out. So wait, Let's the see what school there is. can do stuff or they can't? This that's information. We can provide information about what the bond will be used for. But you've created a website. Yes. We, added, we, added, a web, we added a web page, which links to the press release it has a, a link to the press release a link to three local articles about the bond and then as anna said shares information around what what things if the measure passes it would go to replace replace roofs you know like the specific it's a breakdown. things it doesn't advocate and that's where the line is it doesn't advocate passage of it or just speaks about the board um voted to go out to this for this bond measure and share some information around that. And it breaks it down. I'm where, assuming like this correct. is where this is how much is going to this, this is how much no. is going to this. That's correct. when what we voted on was just lump sum. We went and had the breakdowns. It's the same. The information I think is the same as what we gave the board in January. Mm -hmm. And it's what I think good. we put the, in what would be on the ballot, right? The one we voted on was generic because you said it would be roughly, I didn't have the exact quotes, so it'd be roughly this, roughly. So you're using those it's numbers? Be, yeah, it'll yeah. always be a process until I can actually go out well, and do our for, the, for the contractors and all that. Okay. And is there a reason that we've waited this long to put any promotion out? I mean, no, we are promotion. Or information out because it's now less you know less than a month before they go to vote on it so that seems okay. yes i don't know if that's normal i think it was just the under there was an understanding that it sounds like the district just needed us to approve it nothing was going to be done with it right and then there were some additional conversations that happened and um, do you expect it to pass with no information out I mean, I, I, I haven't really. I haven't the last bond it. measure we did was $66 million. It would have cost taxpayers an additional 10 cents. We hired a promotional company. We had videos. We had mailers. The PAC sent out mailers. Um, we had, you know, all kinds of stakeholder input and it passed. So I can't predict. We actually had a polling company tell us they've never seen such support for a school bond. 
and there was just absolutely nobody who thought it was going to pass, that, that it was going to fail, and it failed. So I can't predict. I don't know what will happen. I guess maybe there's not as much to do anymore. I say, use me with whatever you need. Let's let's do this, right? Let's get this information out, um, and we'll just do what we can from here. Communications, social media, all the things that we can do in the next month. And word of mouth, obviously. Okay, alert me with whatever I can do to help. Okay, we will move on to 4-2. Uh, Dr. Skinner is now here. Um, so Dr. Skinner is coming from, her husband is here as well. Um, uh, she is currently in Midland, Texas, um, where she works right now. We are thrilled to be adding her as an addition to our district. Um, so we thought we would give her the ability to kind of introduce herself and just so um, people could put a face for the name that didn't necessarily get to community nights or when she was in town last um, running as a candidate. So. Right. Well, thank you so much. I am so excited about being here along with my husband, Michael. So I am just honored to accept the superintendent position uh, with the Crook County School District. So first off, I want to thank the school board for number one, believing in me and giving me this opportunity to be able to serve you know, the students, the staff parents, the families, the community. It's just such an honor. I also want to thank the administrators and the scholars and the community members for hosting me during the full day of the interview process. So it was very nice to really get some important insight into what you value, what you find important, and what the needs are of the districts. It was very important for me to hear that. Um, so I just really want to thank everyone. It's just a great honor to be here. Uh, really the cornerstone, I would say, of my first 100 days is to listen, to learn about the streets, the needed improvements, the opportunities. Um, I really want to just build a collective plan with everyone, various perspectives, so that we can build that plan to work together to benefit the scholars of our district. So just a few goals, I would say, for the first 100 days is to build relationships. I want to build open and honest communication, transparency, so then we can really begin to work together and to bridge any gaps so that we can just all work um, collaboratively. Um, and then really next, just increase effectiveness and efficiency so that we can provide excellent support to our schools, to our campuses, to the scholars, to the families. Um, I want to be visible on all the campuses and just provide that support. And then, of course, what we're all here for, uh, the you know, success of our students. We want to have increased student outcomes. We want to really close achievement gaps for our students. And I love what Joel was saying about early literacy. That's my love and passion area. Um, I was a first grade teacher for many years. So it's just very important for me to see readers uh, in our schools. Um, I think until that happens, you do put band-aids on things for a very long time. So I'm super excited to jump in and join any reading initiatives that I can support. I think it's very important to uh, the success of our school district. So again, just thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to accept this position. And I think together we are absolutely going to succeed. I just think, again, it's a collective effort. And I'm just so happy to join the team. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, are you ready? Yeah, let's jump back. We bounce back to and a shout out to our uh, tech department, <laughs> Eric Ryan, for troubleshooting on the fly. Um, so just jumping back to goal one point one, um, the board asked in uh, January to explore proficiency in both social studies and science, which is something um, that's been embedded in our elementary uh, curriculum, like. Uh, when you think of high school, you, you take U.S. history class, so you have a final, whereas at elementary, it's usually embedded in the English language arts curriculum. So what I did uh, for social studies um, was I pulled uh, at each trimester, uh, elementary teachers do give uh, a grade for social, uh, social studies and science. So this is the distribution um, of uh, social studies grades for our elementary students. 
So it looks like um, the vast majority, uh, and this is all our elementary students, are uh, meets the grade level standards. And this would be based off um, the teacher's uh, assessment of students' abilities on assigned social studies assignments. Uh, maybe there's a quiz or two, um, those sort of things. So we have uh, a proportion with the meets plus and then a portion on both sides of progressing and then a few uh, progressing minus. So that's this uh, social science distribution. Um, looking at our science, uh, kind of similar uh, bell curve there of you got um, uh, about, I'd say, I don't know, a quarter uh, in meets plus, uh, the majority in meets, and then some in progressing. So that's the distribution of uh, winter grades of our elementary students. Um, the second one, what I really, uh, what I really is, I think we have to invest our time, energy, and money into getting um, our elementary students reading. So um, this is Dibbles. So uh, they take a fall and winter Dibbles. They'll also take a spring. And this shows uh, the distribution of both scores over four categories. Uh, you know, red, which would be below, yellow, which would be nearly meeting, green, which would be proficient, and blue, which would be exceeding. Um, you can see uh, when you look at this, uh, kindergarten. So in the fall, they assess kindergartens, you know, I think within the first couple of weeks. So you would expect that the first week in kindergarten, you don't know all your letters and the letter sounds. So what's awesome to see here is we still see some red and yellow. And, and that's something as we go into the spring test, we really need to getting those kids into intervention. But you can see we've had a tremendous amount of growth from fall to winter in our kindergartners. Um, what I think uh, hearing Dr. Skinner is we have to get our observe objectively look at what interventions we're doing. So when, when a kid scores red, what happens then? What is the tier two intervention? What is the tier three intervention? And making sure those are effective. It's just like if you're sick uh, and you take medicine and you don't get better, well, do we need to adjust the dose? Do we need to adjust the frequency? So really looking at our interventions and seeing how we can be more effective there. Um, so you can see uh, as well, that would be the distribution from um, for the, those K-5 levels. So that's something that we'll work with principals to say, what's going on in our tier two? How can we improve to, to increase the effectiveness of those interventions? Because we know every kid's not going to get it the first time. We, we've all been in school and I remember I still struggle with fractions. So, but what do we do when kids don't, don't learn and, and what, what are the next steps uh, to make sure they do catch up? So... Um, those are our dibbles, and I'll come back uh, in July with the spring data. So they'll take this test. Um, it does get harder because you add more standards as the year goes on, um, but that those are the kind of benchmark assessments that we get. Going on back to our, our chart, um, so this is just talking about some of our next steps in the time being. Um, I have, I regularly, or I very uh, seldomly write in all caps, but all caps, regular attendance. We have to partner with our parents, partner with our community to get kids coming to school. We can have the best tier one instruction, tier two instruction, but if kids aren't showing up, they're not going to be learning. So that's another big area that I don't believe uh, we've talked much about attendance this year. And that has to be a board priority next year and partnering with our parents, partnering with families to get kids showing up regularly to school. Um, another thing, we will be starting the uh, Kirk County High School ASVAB, uh, Mr. Huffman and his team. They, this was a pilot to show, hey, our kids are graduating at a high rate, but how are their academics? What are they learning? We will be doing an ASVAB. Uh, this spring, we're piloting to see how students do on that and then having our guidance counselors follow up with students based on results. Uh, we still do the social studies honor cord. Um, so students that want a red, white, and blue honor cord, they take an additional social studies assessment um, at the high school and they get a, a special cord. Uh, like I said, we need to develop better intervention programs, make sure that they're being effective. Uh, high school early literacy collaboration projects. Uh, that's uh, Ms. Kurtz at the high school is looking at taking some of her kids, her high school students, and having them um, serve as literacy specialists down at the elementary schools, which I think is a, an awesome way to just start attacking this um, full force. Uh, the middle school is piloting a new program called iReady. Um, that's something we, we haven't really had a good benchmark in place, so they're trying it out this year, uh, as well as the intervention component of that. Um, like I talked about early with our volunteer, we're going to start a community volunteer literacy partnership program. Um, so we'll kick that off uh, in, in the fall. And um, and then finally, uh, 
we need to look at whether we have a good elementary social studies and science assessment. Right now, it's just going off, you know, the teacher's grades, um, what's, what sort of assessments. It, um, but we don't want to just throw assessments onto the system um, if we're not preparing kids. So we need to explore and work with our principals and teachers of what that really looks like and what would be an effective assessment to get some good data on how our students are doing with social studies and science. Is that what iReady is, social studies and science? Um, no, iReady is uh, English language arts and math, and that's just at the middle school right now. Is that what these numbers are coming from, or you want to move to utilizing this system? Uh, we are piloting this year. I believe a good move would be we pilot it this year. We kind of get a sense of like, what does this data look like? Uh, and then next year, say like, hey, this is our official, uh, official benchmark test fall, winter, spring, just like Dibbles is for our elementaries. And then the math on K through five, Joel, 44% level yeah. two or higher. Really good question. So uh, math, so we use a, a, a benchmark assessment called um, Imagine Math. Uh, just like in Dibbles, that gives a fall, winter, spring. Uh, Imagine Math was great during COVID because folks could work on it when students were doing distance learning, they could work on it from home. It had an intervention program. Um, We've had a three-year contract with them, and we're not planning to renew that contract. Um, Cherry is looking to explore, I believe, uh, three or four different products. I want to say Renaissance uh, Learning, the program called Freckle. Am I making this up? The Freckle is under the umbrella of Renaissance. Renaissance is yeah. the company. Freckle is their intervention fluency component. Yeah, so she's having some teachers and staff member, members look at if that's a good replacement for that benchmark assessment. So. I didn't look, I looked through the math curriculum, but do the curriculums not come with their own they have like what? benchmark testing throughout the curriculum? Because it just seems crazy that you can pull science and social studies off of ELA for K through five, but then we're we're at math, 44%, I'm assuming is passing a level two or higher. How many levels are there? And if yeah. we're getting rid of this to pilot something else, is that because it it goes better with, I just don't understand all of the extra testing. It seems like yeah. if we're adopting curriculums, are, are there not benchmark testing throughout the curriculum to know the kids are learning the curriculums? I can or do they need an outside that one. Test? So um, our curriculums are it's set into modules that teach a set number of standards, like for like units, like unit one, then you take, you take an assessment, unit two, um, where it's just, covering the unit they just taught, whereas these benchmarks look at the entirety of the you know, second grade math standards. I think one thing that's really important as we're looking at student learning, it, there's this balance between, we never wanna over test students, right. but then we don't wanna assess where they're at just based on one measure. You know, you want multiple measures because we all know that you know, some assessments kids don't do well on. So we don't wanna base everything solely off one assessment. So it's, it's finding that fine line of, uh, we don't want to have too many assessments, but we want to make sure we have multiple measures to really see where kids are at. And uh, curriculum usually is a unit-based thing where at the end of the unit, they'll take an assessment, uh, whereas benchmarks are, are kind of the, the whole the whole entirety of the uh, standards for that grade level. So I think this would be one. Of, another idea I had was to, um, each one of these has like sample tests. And I thought it'd be interesting to like, on maybe the district webpage, show the sample assessments of what these are. So that way parents and families can know, like when we say, oh, 44% are proficient or not proficient, they could go and look at that assessment and get a sense of what are, what are they asking my kid and then kind of be a partner in helping kind of expand the learning uh, to, the, to the home as well. So are we of these levels, so level two or higher in Imagine Math, I'm assuming it starts at level one? Yeah, uh, so I believe Imagine is four four levels so that would be the the nearly and above so when they're in nearly that means hey give those kids some intervention if they're below level two that's like you are way below grade level so we have 56 percent way below grade level k through five yes so they would need special intervention So I think, and I think that question highlights our need to really look at our elementaries and our intervention systems and English language arts and math. 
And I'm really hoping Midland, Texas brings some oh, awesome oh, uh, expert, well, expert, just, expertise in uh, ready to jump in intervention. I'm ready to right now. Yeah. Because I, I know both our, our, our teachers and our admin are pouring just about everything they have into that. Um, so really need to look at, hey, we're working hard. How do we get a little more juice uh, out of that squeeze uh, to make sure those interventions are, are really supporting student learning? And is the Dibbles reading and writing, or what's the uh, writing levels in K? Dibbles K is just reading. Um, let me pull, Eric, let's see if this one. What I can do is I will email writing. Um, I did, and I'm glad you asked. I did pull high school writing uh, while uh, we were talking. Ninth grade is at 85.64. And that would be the winter uh, writing sample. 10th grade is at 97.23, I believe. 11th grade is at 94.39. And I need to check on that 12th grade number. So I'll email that as well as the 9th, oh, um, uh, 85.64. 10th, 97.23. 11th, 94.39. And I need to double check the uh, 12th grade number because it was a blank. So um, and when I come in July, I'll break it down by grade level and just have that as a chart for you. If, if you like looking at the, the grade level distribution, that's easy to do. Um, so we can have that for you. The eighth grade number is all at 59%. When yeah. did you pull that number? Because that, I mean, you're drastically higher school. at the high school with yeah. the same group of kids. So that, so that was the, sense. well, that was this year, eighth testing? graders. And this year's ninth graders. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not yeah. So it was, yeah, yeah, not the not gotcha. the same kids. So okay. Um, but that's really easy data to pull and, and look at grade level, just like the dibbles where you can see each grade level. So we can have that in that format for you um come spring. And I'll email you the uh elementary numbers tonight and tomorrow. Any other questions for Joel? Okay, thanks, Joel. Anna, we'll move on to your finance report. Now it's back to 5.0. Okay. I don't have a lot on the finance report. As you've seen, um, our revenue is coming in higher than expected. Our expenses are coming in lower than expected. Um, and that's what we always hope for. And um, what will happen next month is I'll bring to you a budget change proposal, which is very normal. We do two or three times a year a budget change this year. We just haven't done it until I close to the end of the year. Um, but that'll have some um, proposed changes to the budget for some unexpected expenditures that we're seeing. And then it'll also have a proposal to increase the transfers out of the general fund, which is how it'll fund maintenance reserve, et cetera. So um, every school district that I know of does these at least once a year, if not more. And we in the past have done this every two or two or three times, one or three times a year. So I'll explain a lot more, but I just wanted to give you a kind of a advance warning that that'll be coming and you haven't seen that before. Did anybody have any questions on the finance report? It's, are you bringing, what you're bringing to the next board meeting is what we're doing in our committee meeting? It'll be May, the May regular board meeting. But I, the budget, I'm sorry, the budget committee meeting in the end of April, is that what we're bringing in? No, yeah. that'll be separate. Separate, okay. Thank you for asking that, so I can clarify. The budget committee meeting on April 25th and 30th, I, um, I should have those memorized for the 29th world, but um, those are to adopt, well, it's to approve, it's to have the budget committee approve the budget for the next school year, 24-25. The budget that we see in front of us was was adopt, adopted, approved last April, adopted last May or June. And things change over the course of a year. There's new information that comes out. And we like to be nimble and flexible and be able to change with the information that we have. Um, otherwise, the alternative is bureaucratic sluggishness. And we don't want to be like that. So that's why we do these adjustments right here. So the May regular board meeting will be a resolution that will just the budget for the current fiscal year 
like to add that the sounds like Mr. and Mrs. Bates really up their average teaching experience years out here. Brothers is double everyone else, it looks like <laughs> <laughs> teaching experience. <laughs> Any questions for Anna on finance? We'll move to public comments. So we have Holly Kingsbury. Um, hello, uh, Holly Kingsbury, one of the parents of our musical children. Mm -hmm. um, I am bringing you the concern that our fence isn't completely enclosed so kids can get to the highway. Um, we have at least four kindergartners that are coming in the next few years. Um, and one of our son is um, on the autism spectrum and I'm worried particularly about him escaping if he's able to attend brothers. Um, so I'm the one that drew the straw to bring forward. Um, we really need to enclose the school. There's three exit points. Um, so I'm assuming this would be one. You'd have to go out this door. Yeah, right here. You can go around the front of the old red school and then also out the back right and here. Where is the fence that's open or not enclosed? All seven? All those three. All of them are open. Yeah, you okay. can go around the front of the red school Okay. You can go between the gym and the, the current school, and then from this wall um, back to the existing fence, you can come around okay. through the parking lot. Um, and also, I asked for opinions from the teachers, and that they would like to bring up that a six-foot fence, especially along the highway, um, would be a nice addition. Um, and growing up out here, the speed limit is for, no, it's 55 now. Right. And people do not do that. Um, so that's a huge concern. Leland, do we have yeah. the fencing here on a maintenance list? That was anywhere? my next question. Oh my Oh, okay. it is writing down as you were talking. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was coming, I didn't know who I need to go to. Leland is our maintenance. Yeah. He keeps track of the school um, fences. Leland is big on, so um, he's pretty up to date on yeah. where so fences. Give me my phone number if you okay. need it. Yeah. I bet I can get it from uh, the teachers. It. Yeah, I bet he does. <laughs> I know he does. <laughs> okay. Leland, uh, do you have a plan for a six foot fence on your list of or? So my plan would be to put a six foot fence completely around the entire. The, the entire property. Okay. So that's kind of what I'm looking at doing. Okay. Awesome. Do we, I guess, what is the fencing that's out here that not six foot existing? So there's a there's a six foot fence out there, but that's a Odon. Um, that's oh. Odon's fence. Oh, it's not our, okay. It's not our fence. Are you allowed to attach onto that? So at uh, least yeah. you wouldn't have that side? Yeah, call it that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. So, and then back here, Leland, or is this our fence that just we need to just connect to? Our property actually goes out past that fence, so as long as as we're good with where that fence is at now, we would just extend that fence so it's a six foot fence all the way out. Okay. And do we have plans in the near future to enclose these or a way to enclose them until we can do a, a long? Cost, well, the enclosures, the places where it's open, I can deal with. This out here is, is kind of tough. So, I mean, we can lock that gate, but, but the students can still get through that gate. Okay. Everything else can be repaired. Okay. Um, so, you know, in the short term, we can make sure that it, the, the repairs are done to it. And then the eventual plan would be to put a six foot fence. And probably a gate of some sort here so that it's completely enclosed. Okay. Is that in the plans before the start of next school year? It's in the plans, but I haven't set a date to do it yet. So do you think maybe we could do the safety side of it and get the temporary that's enclosures easy. put up before we get a six foot fence put all the way around yeah, in, that's easy to in the near future for students out here? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And it sounds like we'll need to get a hold of ODOT, Leland, or are you just going to do a fence up to there and utilize their line as long as it's there? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So Holly, if you also want to grab Leland's phone yeah. number, it sounds like Mr. Bates has it as well, um, but um, I'm sure we'd be happy to continue communication in regards to closing off those entrances for now and then get a game plan for an actual six foot fence all the way around. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Kat? Can I just stand here? Or... Oh, okay. You're welcome to stand. But, uh, just a couple quick things. Uh, thank you, board, for being willing to serve. God. <laughs> Uh, the other thing is, uh, I noticed in the past few meetings, you've changed the public comments to there, and I like that. I I think it was a good move. That's it. We will revisit that um, hopefully in June, July, when Dr. Skinner's here, and um, so we may look at moving that, um, but we kind of tabled that till so we have another discussion about it. So it's good to hear some feedback. So. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion pieces? Comments, concerns, questions? I just really like to thank uh, Dr. Skinner and oh, yeah. Michael for coming all the way out to be in person to sign your contract. It shows your dedication and your time to our school, and we're very, very grateful and thankful. And and you picked the meeting all the way out in Brothers. <laughs> so you you got a tour on your way out. So thank you for coming. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. I want to start off on the right foot and get to know everyone. And just so honored. Again, thank you. And thank you to Brothers for hosting us. Mm -hmm. Much appreciated. Yeah, yeah. and a uh, special thank you to uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, uh, all the chair setups and the oh, and the treats and their list of things that they accomplish every day. Mm -hmm. Just they are amazing. Mm -hmm. and driving for the work of the kids. So mm -hmm. what you see is their work. Thank you. Thank you. Your music is beautiful. Music? Yeah, yeah, uh, you can sing. <laughs> we are also really thankful for all of the board and staff to come all the way to Brothers. Yeah. I think we have all but one family at this meeting right now. Oh, wow. So if we're looking at statistics in terms of parents, <laughs> <laughs> you're on it. You're all here. All right. We really appreciate you guys uh, coming way out here and it really matters. And it's a good omen to you that you start here. <laughs> this is a great school. So. This great here. <laughs> Okay, so our upcoming dates, we have, um, as Anna mentioned, we have our budget committee meeting April 25th, um, 6.30 p.m. at the district office. We have our next school board work session on April 29th, also at the district office. Uh, 4 p.m. on that, uh, we start a bit earlier on those. And then um, we have an executive session to follow um, our work session that night. We have our second budget committee meeting scheduled for April 30th at 6.30 at the district office. And my understanding is, Anna, that's uh, tentative if everything is not resolved on the 25th or both meetings happening. You could approve the budget the first meeting yeah. if you so choose. Okay, and then if not, we move to the 30th. Yes. Okay, I wanted to make sure about that. And our next school board meeting is May 13th at 6.30 at the district office. And our last listening session of the school year is May 20th, 6.30 at the district office. And we have no school Memorial Day on May 27th. So we'll join this meeting.